morning, everybody. It's just after six. Even the town hall clock is right tonight. That's pleasing. So good evening, officers, council members and members of the public. For the purpose of the recording, I'm going to ask uh, everybody on the committee to just approve their... I'm getting signatures. Point of order, Chair, we Somebody. can't hear awfully well. Is that, is that try that any better? Is it? That's this building, you sure? You sure? Is it? Uh, I'm not sure who our sound man is into the tonight, whether he can. Yeah, can you? Try it. Is that any better? No, it's echo, not volume, is it? Yeah. Hang on. Right. right. We'll see if we can do that. I. Yeah, they're winding the volume down. I think. <laughs> right. Let us try. Anyhow, my name's Councillor White, John White, and I'm chairman this evening. The other councillors taking part, and I'm going to introduce them separately and ask them to confirm they are present. We have um, Councillor Alexander. Present, Chairman. Councillor Baker. Good evening, Chairman. Councillor Codling. Good evening, Chairman. Councillor Guglielmi. Councillor Harris. Evening, Chairman. Councillor Placey. Evening, Chair. And Councillor Wiggins. Evening, Chairman. The TDC officers assessing us tonight are the Acting Director of Planning. We have the Planning... Uh, we do not have the Planning Manager at this time. Uh, we have the Planning Solicitor, Planning Officers and Committee Staff. The Public Speaking mm -hmm. Procedure tonight will be as usual, except that in item five, this is a deferred item, and I will not be allowing public speaking. I've got an echo now. Have you all got an echo? Uh, right. Um, in the remaining items, I shall ask the officer to introduce the application to show any photos or videos of the site. The public speaking will be as usual, namely, I will ask the applicant or his agent to speak. I'll then ask members of the public who have asked to speak, either for or against the application that's in front of us. This will be followed by speakers from the Town or Parish Council, and finally, the ward councillor. Councillors will then have a chance to question the officer. And once all questions are answered, we will turn into a general debate. When all the points are discussed, I shall ask if we've got a resolution and go through the normal procedure of asking for a proposer and seconder. Now, tonight, I'm going to vary the agenda in that we will take the first item that uh, we have, which is Main Road Dover Court, but we also have um, a special item uh, that has been brought to us by the residents of Nelson Road, and it's shown on the schedule as item four, uh, I'm going to bring that forward to item two tonight to enable them just to hear that. That is a petition. Right. Any member of the public like to follow this meeting? It can be found on the internet by logging into www.tenderingdc.gov.uk forward slash live meeting. And I'm going to look for the officer just to confirm that the live stream is going out but I haven't had confirmation of that but I'm sure it will be very shortly um, 
Anyhow, as usual, it not only goes out live, but it will be recorded by the council and available on the council website. Right, it is live streamed apparently. Now, let us turn to item one on the agenda. Apologies for absence. My vice chairman, Councillor Fowler, has had to withdraw at the last minute. And therefore, I don't have a vice chairman. And I have asked Councillor Baker if he would stand in as my vice chairman, as long as that gets everybody's agreement. It seems to there is no opposition, in which case, Councillor Baker, you're welcome to come up and sit somewhere up here. I'm not quite sure where. But <laughs> that's the best way. Right. He's brought his own microphone and from my end, the sound is a bit better now, is it? Uh, everybody confirmed that is? Good. So, uh, welcome, Councillor Baker. Now, tonight we've got two sets of minutes to approve. We've got the minutes of the meeting of the 22nd of September and the minutes of the 27th of September. Um, I haven't had any notification that there are errors or omissions on either set. So I'd ask your permission to be able to sign them. Um, let us start with the minutes of the 22nd of September. Okay for that. Yes, I'm getting. And were you listed? No, I don't think you're listening. So that's, I'll sign those in that case. On the 27th of September, um, again, uh, is everybody happy with those? They are. Right, I will sign those then. Uh, now then, declarations either pecuniary or personal. Does anybody have declarations? I'll start with on the council. Is there anybody? Yes, Councillor Tracy. Um, yeah, the uh, uh, is it a minute? I'll find the right agenda here. Yeah. Agenda item five, Upper Dover Court. Um, I wasn't present at the last meeting when it was deferred, so I'm unable to take part in this one. Yes, I also wasn't present. Declarations from the committee. I think one of the officers wants to make a declaration as well. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just uh, for the public record in the, and in the interests of being open and transparent, uh, I need to indicate that I have a personal uh, interest in gender item eight, which is uh, report A4, the petition in respect to the planning enforcement matter at Nelson Road, Clacton on Sea, insofar as my mother is a resident of Nelson Road, Clacton on Sea. Uh, but uh, I have checked and uh, she was not one of the signatories to the petition. Very great for Mr. Ford. Um, but as you're not involved in the vote, it would, uh, that is noted. Um, Right, item four, questions to me under the procedure. I have received none. Uh, item five is the planning application 22 stroke 01083 full. This is the deferred item um, where we ask the officers to get uh, various bits more of information. And so if we're all ready to go, I'm going to ask the planning officer um, for his comments on this. Uh, 
Mr. Yasma. Thank you, Chairman. Just, um, just bear with us for 10 seconds. Um, we've got a couple of technical issues, but I think it's been resolved. <laughs> Ooh, just in time. <clears throat> right. Um, okay. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, members. So uh, this item concerns the social club in Dover Court. Uh, and members will recall um, at its August 2022 planning committee. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, so at its August 2022 planning committee, um, this item was deferred to allow the applicants to provide an operational management plan as well as a noise survey. Um, this has now been done, submitted to the council and a reconsultation carried out. So by way of introduction, the Planning application proposes a change of use from a disused Methodist chapel to a social club, as well as internal and external alterations. And the properties um, in Upper Dover Court, it's the former Methodist Church, 618 Main Road. <clears throat> so the site plan is there displayed on your screen. Um, the site is located just to the north on the northern side of the green. Uh, the green comes off or um, runs off Main Road in Upper Dover Court. The property is um, located in a sustainable location in the, within the settlement development boundary of, of Dover Court. Immediately to the west is a residential property just on the other side of that access lane, which is also called Main Road. Um, so that property immediately to the west there is the nearest noise sensitive property as referred to in the noise impact assessment. I don't know if you can see. You can see my cursor there. So immediately to the east of the property is um, the Trafalgar pub. That pub is currently in operation. The area is predominantly residential, uh, and there's also a cemetery further to the north. Um, it's the Dover Court Cemetery. The report refers to um, um, Wheelie Cemetery, but that, that's a typo. Uh, so everywhere where it's referred to as Wheelie, it should just be replaced with Dover Court. So moving on to the floor plans, the proposed ground floor plan, this is the frontage building facing the street. Uh, so that contains the main bar and the darts hall, the pool room. Members have been on site today again. Um, there's a stage area and then there's also a um, toilet facilities. There's a covered area linking the frontage building with the rear building, which is um, labeled as the function room here on this plan. And there's also a um, storage room, a kitchen area and some WC facilities there. There's, um, there's a doorway in the rear elevation providing access to the rear. And there's a um, there's a fence around the rear access area or the rear the rear um, garden area. This is a photograph showing the front of the um, former Methodist Church in context with the adjacent Trafalgar pub. It's quite a quite a wide building, and that's just panning to the towards the west. It shows the uh, the second half of the of the building facing the street there. And you can just about see the side elevation of, of the um, nearby residential property to the west. This is the rear of the hall building and that fence in, fenced enclosure that I was referring to earlier. And this is the inside of the hall building. And there's a couple of photographs showing the inside of the church, the, the frontage building. So following the uh, 20, the August 2022 deferral, um, the applicants have provided the operational plan as well as the noise impact assessment. Uh, consultation carried out and environmental health continues to raise no objection. We have provided members with uh, an update sheet containing a revised wording to condition three to specifically capture the elements in terms of noise mitigation and abatement that needs to be carried out prior to any social events commen commencing. 
so the condition three, the revised wording to condition three is circulated around. We have also attached the um, operational plan to that to that circulation. Members are well aware that there are significant local concern and opposition to this proposal. All those areas of concern have been addressed in the committee report, um, and the recommendation remains unchanged for the for the reasons set out in the officer report. Members are requested to consider officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Thank you very much. Um, we we have no speakers, so councillors, now is your chance to ask any questions that you wish. Given that when we sent it back last time, but there were specific items that we asked for the sound uh, assessment and the operational uh, plan. So. Um, if there are no questions, we can go straight into a debate, if anybody indicates that they wish to speak. Councillor Harris. Yeah, I'm sure there's some questions we've, we've all got. Um, I'm going to go straight into to, to the vote, I'm sure. But um, yeah, from, from memory that, yeah, as you've just said, Chairman, this last time it was, we sent this back because we were waiting for um, the report on noise and also the operational plan um, if I can ask the officers um, just to just to completely clarify please whether they believe that this um, noise assessment is satisfactory um, and you believe that it has been carried out in the in the correct methodology and that you don't have any concerns and it meets all of the concerns that that would fall under sort of planning considerations um, and also the operational plan as well whether you believe that that is satisfactory as well and if I can come back after that thank you so, right. thank you yeah, very much you wish to answer yeah. so so our understanding is the um, so the noise impact assessment has been has been carried out by a um, noise consultant we have undertaken the, the necessary consultation with environmental health again, um, and as part of their response back to us, we haven't received any concerns or any red flags in terms of the methodology or the, or the, um, the quality or the completeness of the report. Uh, environmental health continue to, to raise no objection subject to, to conditions, including the, the revised condition. Um, the operational plan is a very useful um, sort of appendix document, background document um, that supplements the the planning application. Um, there's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of repetition between the um, operational plan and the noise impact assessment. Um, and there's also a lot of useful information in the operational plan that is not necessarily relevant to planning, but it is useful ne nevertheless to, to gauge a, a very thorough and complete understanding of how this social club how they are proposing to operate and to run this uh, this facility. Thank you, Chairman. Right, uh, Councillor. Okay, second question. Yes, Ron. Thank you. Um, Noises, from my perspective, is, is certainly the, the main consideration in this, and and listening to the views of of the residents there. Um, you know that's that's the I think that and parking, but that the noise is is the and disruption and nuisance is the is the key uh, potential fear for something like this coming in in a uh, in a residential area. If the committee were mindful, based on this report which says that noise is not a problem, if this committee was mindful to approve this. Um, what reassurance could be given to residents that should it actually not be the case and that noise does become a nuisance, are there any 
actions or any recourse that those residents could take, please. Chairman? So, so yes, you're right. Um, Councillor is right. No, noise is, a, is one of the key considerations here, um, and that, that is reflected in the in the committee report. Um, so, in terms of reassurance, so we we have, I mean, there, there's various elements here, I guess. So, so there's there's noise um, noise uh, emanating from the from the premises. There's noise associated. There could be noise associated with um, you know, car parking, people arriving, departing. So there, there are a, uh, a lot of areas that 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 moves outside of of the the scope of planning. However, in, in terms of 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 reassurance, so I guess in the main, um, concerned residents will have three three avenues to to escalate um, complaints or concerns. Firstly, um, if if it's to do with a um, a potential breach to a planning condition, a planning condition as recommended in the report and update and the um, update sheet, if if it's if it revolves around that, then their first course of action will be to contact the planning enforcement team um, and lodge a complaint via that avenue. If if the concern is around persistent um, noise noise nuisance emanating from the property um, that falls outside of the scope of any of the planning conditions then the course of action would be to contact the council's environmental health team they've got a um, all those details are on the council's website um, they've got a 24 hour i believe 24 hour complaint telephone number if if the concern is around indiscriminate parking or highway safety, um, illegal parking, those kind of things, then that's all. That will be the re the relevant tendering t tendering um, park. Am I correct in saying that tendering is the enforcing authority for parking, or is it Essex Highways? Gary. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so Essex Highways through the, the, the partnership that the councils have with them. But of course, if we're talking about danger uh, to the public, the, the police, uh, of course, is, a, is another uh, avenue of recourse. Thank you. So that, those are in the main the, um, the, the three avenues. There is, of course, also the planning service if there are general um, concerns around, you know, directly relevant to to the planning report and the planning approval. Um, mem members of the public can also make contact with with the planning service if it's if it straddles into that area. And of, lastly, there's also um, um, a, li a license has already been granted for this premise. So if there are potential breaches of the license, then members of the public can also get in touch with Tendering District Council's licensing department. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no further questions at this moment, but I might come back in. Thank you. Go to uh, Councillor Wiggins. Thank you, Chair. Um, all I wanted to know, I want uh, clarification on the um, the times on the on page 40 about the licensing section for indoor sporting events. Because in theory, Sunday to Thursday is 10 till half past midnight, and Fridays to Saturday is 10 till midnight. And then when it comes to the proposed opening hours. They differ, and I just wanted to really give clarification on that, please. They they differ indeed, um, but I can confirm that the, the planning conditions trump the uh, information contained in the licensing section of this report. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Harris. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of the things that we are constantly reminded uh, on the planning committee is or the word is fairness and we have to, to view each application on its own merits and also be fair to all sides. Um, in, in view of, of that, 
right next door to this, there is already a pub, which you mentioned, which is the Trafalgar River Garden. Um, and presumably, you know, they may, I mean, I haven't drunk in there, but um, I'd like to. But I mean, um, there's uh, there possibly could be noise potential uh, coming from there. Do, do we have on record any um, restraints, uh, restrictions, or notice of any complaints about that? I know it's a separate thing, but it's I'm just viewing, you know, are we adding fuel to the fire by, by potentially saying yes to this if we've already got a problem next door? Thank you, Chairman. Um, so in, in terms of the... Just just by background, the the opening hours, the proposed opening hours for the social club um, compared to the Trafalgar pub are generally very very similar. We've 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 had in terms of the information that we could obtain um, about the Trafalgar pub, the the opening hours are very similar. Um, and in terms of uh, previous historic complaints, are, are you are you referring to the to the Trafalgar pub in particular now? Yeah, so we, we have um, seen in terms of our system, um, there are a, a very small handful of um, planning enforcement complaints. Um, I need to stress that's a very small number and they are historic complaints, um, but nothing recent of any substance. In terms of environmental health complaints relating to the Trafalgar, um, there was a noise, a report of a noise incident in April of this year, and before that, um, there was also a complaint dating way back to 2010, also about noise and loud music. Yes, Councillor Baker. Th thank you, Chairman. Excuse me. Thank you, Chairman. Um, with regard, if we can go to page 49 in condition 6, please which is um, to make sure there's no disturbance for... Um, I'm presuming uh, 10 till 4, Monday to Friday, um, to the neighbouring cemetery and residential amenity. Um, would it be unfair for us to increase that, to include Saturday and Sunday, or at least Sunday, because... 10 to 4, Monday to Friday, um, there may be fewer, I would suggest there were fewer visitors to a cemetery than there would be at the weekend. Uh, I'd just like your thoughts on whether it would be reasonable to either impose that condition for every day of the week or, or just include Monday to Friday and Sunday. Thank you. Uh, the why behind that condition six, um, you know, the way it, it's evolved is to um, protect the, the cemetery and to allow the, the cemetery to operate um, during weekdays um, without any undue disturbance coming from the social club. So that, that, that's the, the reason, the, main, the high level reason behind the condition. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's entirely, you know, members of the committee as a, as a, as a panel, are in, you're entirely within your right to, to, to debate this this element, um, obviously you need to have regard to the, um, to the to the tests for planning conditions. One being um, reasonableness, necessity, um, enforceability. Um, I guess it, it it needs to come out in the debate, but dear, dear regard needs to be given to the. Um, you know, to the immediate vicinity, the fact that this is an existing building uh, that benefits from a the previous church use under use class F1. So F1 use class, just, just by way of background, that includes things like the provision of education, the display of works of art, a museum, for example, a public hall or an exhibition hall. So that building in that location currently has an unrestricted F1 use, which includes a church. And our, we, we fully appreciate and acknowledge that the church is clearly very, very different to a social club. Um, and we not for any minute saying that there's similarities. All we are saying is um, that that is a material planning consideration that the, mem that the committee can take into account. Yes, please. 
Um, that's actually cleared something up because <clears throat> obviously if it's for the operation of the cemetery, we're talking about funerals. So that um, doesn't actually make it that clear. Um, I think my, I would be, uh, I'd not ask the question um, in the way I did if I'd have realised it was for visitors who were going to funerals during the week rather than just visiting their loved ones. Thank you for that. Uh, further questions? Ah, Councillor Alexander. Thank you, Chair. Uh, making the comparison between uh, Trafalgar next door and the application before us, uh, we're looking at the opening times. Uh, do they compare to each other or is there uh, a difference between the Uh, insofar as the information we could obtain about the Trafalgar's opening times, both online on their website, the stuff that's available online, as well as the information available um, in you know, council records, the opening hours are very, very similar um, between the Trafalgar and the proposed social club. <clears throat> So there is a possibility that at the end of an evening's entertainment, um, the discharge of the patrons may uh, collide with each other when, when leaving both of the uh, properties. Is that correct? Yeah, there, there is that possibility. Is there an estimated capacity by which um, the, uh, pro uh, the proposed uh, social club before us, have they got a, a minimum idea in their mind? Do they have a maximum, for example, of how many people they will take in one night? Is there a maximum, uh, is, there, is there a minimum? So this, this, is, this will be a... Um as, as submitted, and this will be a, a members only social club. Um, and f we, we don't have any maximum or minimum capacity numbers. Um, there are useful information in the in the operational plan that they've that they've submit that the applicants have submitted um, in September. Um, yeah, I mean the, the 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 question of capacity, maximum capacity in a in a in a planning context is one that's incredibly difficult to enforce. Um, so I would just I would advise members that if if you are going to um, discuss or debate that that topic, um, you need to keep in mind the the test of of um, enforceability and and to a lesser extent reasonableness if you are thinking of conditioning a maximum capacity number in this instance. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, but that aside, it's reasonable to say that from what you have told us, there is no max. So on a busy night, uh, and it says here that it can be used by charities and community life events and loyal clubs, there uh, could be maybe up to one, two hundred people in that hall at any one time coming out at the same time as they would be discharging from the Trafalgar next door. Uh, is that a reasonable question? Um, well, Chairman, so the, obviously one of the one of the big constraints in terms of that question is the size of the building. Um, and so, in terms of, we, I mean, we're considering a planning application tonight. Um, we haven't looked into that level of detail um, at the at the licensing requirements. Um, but I think it just brings it brings me back to I guess my previous answer, which is um, insofar as the planning considerations are concerned here, uh, I think it will be very very difficult to 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 impose a, a restriction here in terms of a, a maximum number of people. Um, obviously, there's 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 the the responsibility of the operator or the um, you know, the operator of the social club. They've got a, a responsibility. Um, there's health and safety requirements 
the, all these things are not necessarily in material planning considerations. So I think at that point, I'm going to have to defer to our, my colleague, Joanne Fisher and Legal. If, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Joanne. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I think you've answered the question um, correctly. Uh, and I think that we have to look at um, planning considerations. And in terms of conditions, as you've quite rightly pointed out, uh, they have to be um, enforceable, precise, reasonable, and necessary in all respects. So I think you have to think about the use that's being proposed and think about whether those conditions are necessary to overcome a, a planning objection, whether they're reasonable in all respects, precise and enforceable. So I haven't got anything further to add. Thank you, Councillor House. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we, we've been to the site twice now, um, and on both occasions, uh, while sitting on the coach, I think all members of the committee had to breathe in so we could actually squeeze down that narrow road um, and because it was so congested. Um, I think, well, obviously, once we were there, we blocked the road and nothing could get in or out. But it was it was almost sort of touch and go where we'd actually get down it because there were vehicles on either side of the road pretty much the whole way down. Parking is a material uh, planning uh, reason. Um, it, it is mentioned here by objectors. Um, it's clear to the committee, or well, clear to me, that there's a, there's a parking issue. Um, can officers advise the committee on that parking problem? Because I think it is a problem. Please. Chairman? Yeah, so, so there are, yeah, there, there are challenges in, in the vicinity um, in terms of Parking. However, I think there are there are four four things that are fundamental and should be at the forefront of, of your minds. I mean, parking is covered in the report, but in in summary, um, insofar as the, the parking material planning consideration is concerned, I think you know the the building is an existing building. Clearly, it's there already. Um, it's, it's next to a, an existing pub. It's in a sustainable location inside within the settlement development boundary of Dover Court. So. So that, that that is a key consideration. Um, there are there are existing parking um, phenomena or you know scenario situations there that but that they are existing road conditions if you like. Um, so it's very difficult to kind of in, in a way um, um, uh, not penalise, but you know I, th I think you you just have to. To bear in mind that they are existing road conditions, um, and then thirdly, due regard needs to be given to the. You know, we've talked about the fallback position previously, but it is a material consideration to to at least um, give regard to the, the 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 very the very possible scenario where this building could revert back to a museum, an art gallery. Um, like a like a a, a a modern church with with loads of um, with with loads of uh, um, incidental functions potentially um, it could revert back to a um, um, a public library so all and all those uses could um, or all those descriptions could could be uncontrolled so in again in terms of parking as well. There is a there's there's a, an opportunity to to look at this with that in mind, as well as potentially to um, to look at, at at restrictions provided that meets the the tests for for planning conditions. But I think those are the four things that members need to take into account. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Thank you very much. I've got one more speaker. Um, of course, on the highway situation, as rightly was said by the councillor, with um, county highways themselves, whilst noticing the problem, have said there's no objections to the proposal. Um, and they weigh that up because uh, it would be unfair to limit anybody 
when the fish shop and the other shop and the pub next door has got no limitations. So it's an awkward one. Councillor Alexander. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> In my previous questions to yourself, I'm, I'm grateful for you given this direction on material consideration, and which brings me swiftly to the to where I'm leading this right now. You mentioned that this could rightfully be returned back to whatever, a church or a library or, or whatever. But uh, do we take that as a material consideration to the application before us, or should we just take what's there? What is your direction on that? So, Chairman, I think we need to stress that that um, our sort of clarification in that regard is, is based purely on the, the fallback position. And we, we really need to stress that a social club is clearly different to a church or a library. Um, and that's, that's also reflected in, in the fact that a social club um, falls under the sui generis use clause, which basically in, in plain English just means it's, it's its own use clause. And that's, in, that's a strong nod to the, to the fact that a social club use is quite a unique use um, with unique planning considerations to, to take into account. So all, all we're saying is, um, you know, what, what it could be without, any in, you know, without the need for any applic planning application, th that is a material planning consideration that you, need, that you can take into account here as part of your, um, you know, your debate and your deliberations here. Thank you, Chairman. Right, councillors, we've uh, given the uh, questions a good hammering. Um, can we sort of develop it now into a proposal? Councillor Harris. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a really difficult one. Um, and again, I think I've said this at most of the meetings um, that we've, we've, we've been uh, been to um, and we've attended, um, is that with any application, you know, we have to look at it in a balanced, have a balanced approach and also look at the harm versus the benefits um, and that word that I mentioned earlier, fairness, all, all comes into it. And, you know, it, it's it's very difficult to try and keep everybody happy. Had this been a, a site well away from uh, residential uh, dwellings, then it, this would be a bit of a no-brainer um, because of the, the positives for, for this site. It's a community centre. It's going to provide... Um, a place to go. It's, you know, they're, they're, they're in the report here, there are, there are lots of things that are listed down here that will benefit the, the community. Um, but there is also the, the harm side, which, you know, is the potential for noise and it is parking. Um, if we address the parking issue, uh, looking at the road, um, as we've seen it a couple of times now, um, you know, if you just looked at the parking, you'd just say, well, there's no parking there. You wouldn't allow anything, including the Trafalgar pub and, and the, the takeaway restaurants down the end because there's no parking. But they seem to thrive and, and, are, and are OK. So in terms of fairness, I think it's already been said, should this business um, be, uh, you know, should, should it be... Um, you know, should we oppose this and say because there's no parking when, you know, there, there's uh, there's issues obviously for, for the other businesses as well. Um, so it's, it, 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 it is a difficult one. Um, my, my concern with the parking, particularly with this one though, uh, would be, you know, there is mention in the report that there's going to be, you know, children's parties there which is great. And, you know, my sons, I used to take them to, to various parties and as they were growing up. And, uh, you know, you almost sort of drop and go. Um, and if there's 10, 15, 20 children there, 
guaranteed there'll be 10, 15, 20 parents in individual cars because we won't go together. And that will all you know, emerge at that site all at the same time, uh, uh, drop off and then pick up. And you know, I can foresee some, some issues there for sure. So parking is a is an issue for me. Um, in terms of noise, you know, we have an expert report here which says that there's no no problems. We we'll, on the parking, we have an expert in Essex Highways that says that they have no concerns as well. So it makes us very makes it very difficult for us on the planning committee to to you know go against those experts um, who say that, that, that you know there's nothing to see here. Um, in terms of restricting the hours further, I think Councillor Baker mentioned it, although it was clarified it, it was to do with the um, uh, the cemetery. Um, I think if, if if we restrict it, and again that word fairness again, any further, we also have to be fair to the business, and the business may think, well, actually, is the viability of this business um, uh, going to be affected if we restrict it? too much and then there's a case of appeal and we can't be seen to be overreaching ourselves in terms of that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I'm seeing something which um, in, in essence is a, is a good facility for the community. Um, and I, I, I therefore, I therefore would propose approval. However, um, on the on the strength that these conditions are very tightly adhered to, that residents have a clear understanding of, and the owners of the business have a clear understanding of what actions are open to the residents in terms of if it falls outside of this and it becomes a nuisance is what what can be done um, but I think on the balance of harm versus um, benefits I think that the benefits marginally outweigh the harm um, that can be done and you know whilst you know I, I, I you know would you know like to support as a small business owner myself I, 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 I support small business you know, I, I doff my cap to, cap to anybody that, that opens a business. Um, but it has to be done. Any business owner, any good business owner knows that if you, if you open a business and you, and you want that business to, to thrive, you have to take your local residents with you and your neighbours with you. You have to. So there's a challenge there for this new business to do just that. What gives me some comfort in this is that it's been pointed out that this is a membership um, facility and therefore this is more able to be controlled as opposed to, uh, let's say, a pub. Um, and I think that there are avenues open here to residents that if it does become a problem, you do have TDC's environmental health, you do have licensing and ultimately the license could be revoked but that's not for this committee to consider um so in terms of purely planning and I'll, I'll, i'm going on a little bit here but it's a, it's a delicate one I'd, I'd like to propose approval thank you chairman i'm quite happy to um second and, and i agree with councillor harris with regard to the the membership gives it um a nod in the affirmative and also this, the conditions that we've laid down, the operation management, I, I think, uh, and also the residents' concerns can be addressed through other avenues if there are any. And let's hope there aren't. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody else wish to speak? I have a proposer now and a seconder. Um, if nobody else wishes to speak, the recommendation will be as written on page 38, with condition three being replaced with this item that came out tonight, which I think hopefully covers all the points that Councillor Harris has raised. Um, 
And uh, so as long as you, you, you understand that. Now, of course, the recommendation calls for the assistant director of planning or otherwise to being delegated. So I'm going to ask Mr. Guyver um, as director of planning, who will be that person? Do we know yet? Thank you, Chairman. So we're going through the process of completing the paperwork because, as we know, Graham Norse will be leaving the authority to retire uh, tomorrow, and John Payton G uh, will be the, the signing officer from that point. Explain to members of the public the uh, Assistant Director of Planning uh, has retired as from this coming Friday. So uh, what we've just heard from uh, the director is, in fact, uh, the planning manager would be the authorised person to issue uh, that, uh, if that's what you wish. So if nobody else wishes to speak, I will take the vote on it. And um, shall we, we can do it with a show of hands. Uh, if that's what you wish. So it's those in favour of granting approval as per the recommendation on page 38 with a revised condition number three on the uh, alterations and additions to the committee that was published now. So you know exactly what you're voting for. And uh, we'll do it with a show of hands. Those in favour, please show. That is everybody who can vote. Right. Thank you. So that application is uh, granted with the revised condition three. Thank you very much. Now, I did say early on of that I would bring forward agenda item eight, which is the uh, receipt of a petition which was submitted to us about a planning enforcement matter in Nelson Road. Um, and I'm going to treat that exactly as I would an application. So I'm going to ask Mr. Guyver if he would just introduce it for us, please. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, everybody. It is quite rare for the committee to be presented uh, with a petition outside of the context of dealing with planning applications. But like the dealing with planning applications, uh, enforcement is one of those uh, non-executive functions uh, that is delegated to the planning committee. And we have been presented uh, with a petition from local uh, residents. And I don't have a, a, a traditional presentation for you, but I will introduce the item and explain the context around it. So the petition uh, that has been received, which is supported by 60 residents within Nelson Road, Clacton, and a further 33 from wider uh, streets, uh, relates to uh, the development of number six, Nelson Road, which was the subject of a 2019 planning application for nine dwellings uh, that was uh, amended through a 2020 uh, planning application granted at the end of 2020. And the uh, petition relates to a request to carry out enforcement action in relation to the state of the footway uh, that has been left following development. Uh, and what you have uh, reported to you is the, the 93 name uh, petition that has been brought on behalf of the lead petitioner, who I understand is going to speak to us uh, by the local ward members who have done a, a sterling job, I've got to say, in terms of reporting the issue uh, to officers. Uh, the issue that the state of the road has been investigated uh, by the planning enforcement officers. I have seen and witnessed the, the state and condition of that area myself uh, last week. And uh, the, the, the committee is essentially asked to consider what action to take 
from this point going forward. The issue relates to the state of the footway and drop curbs that serve uh, the Devon. They are not made up fully, they're not tarmac to their uh, completed standard. Uh, if you uh, view the area, you will see that you have issues with uh, some of the, the, the servicing access being raised because the tarmac has not been raised to the, the co correct height for uh, the footway, as you would expect on a completed footway. But the request for action uh, in, the, uh, in the petition relates to uh, a request to serve notice uh, on the development in terms of a breach of condition notice relating to the state of the footway. But this is something that officers have explored uh, with Essex County Council. And uh, we do have confirmation uh, in writing from Essex County Council that they accept that this issue relates to uh, the powers vested in them in terms of the licensing of drop curves and the maintenance of the highway, and that they are working to uh, resolve this issue. Uh, and it is within their gift to ensure those uh, requirements are complied with and to undertake any necessary enforcement action. Although we have been in a position for some months now, I think it is fair to say, uh, where we have been liaising with our colleagues in the County Council to resolve this issue. And quite understandably, a, a body of local concern uh, has arisen in that area, and this has clearly become a matter of greater public interest than was previously. Uh, so the recommendation, uh, Chairman, is simply uh, as stated in the report, that the committee considers uh, what action is required uh, going forward. Uh, and Chairman, I know you will invite the uh, the lead petitioner and, and ward member to give representations to you. Thank you very much. Now the lead petitioner is Ms. Maria Monteith. I don't know whether she is here. She is, excellent. If you'd like to come forward to uh, the microphone, and when you've got it switched on, uh, Ms. Antif, you uh, you've got um, you've got uh, three minutes. Thank you. All right. Good evening, and thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I'll, I'll keep it short. When we bought the new builds in Nelson Road, it was our understanding that the pavement and drop curbs would be completed before we actually moved in. Um, this has been an ongoing issue for the last year and for some of us longer, as it's not been completed. It's caused us all much stress as this has not been completed. The pavements are a total mess and very uneven. So I've made a few bullet points, which is um, we have water meters, uh, the covers of the water meters protruding above the ground, uh, and it's quite high. It's um, doing our tyres in when we bump up the kerbs, up the pavement, people parking across our drives, uh, lumps of solid cement on the pavement, which has been left from when they've done the building, um, as well as messy stones everywhere. It's a trip hazard in the day and worse of the night. People cannot push their prams or their um, wheelchairs. They have to walk in the road and it's quite distressing for them. Um, people cannot, uh, sorry, it's unacceptable to be left in this condition. So it's created a health and safety issue to many who walk this way and for the residents of the street. So that's my case. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, other speakers now, um, the ward councillor, Councillor Griffiths, um, and Chris, you've, uh, you've got, if you want it, up to five minutes. Oh, and I, I don't think I'll need five minutes on this. I think this is quite unique. This is the first time I think I've actually been in front of this committee for an enforcement, and probably the first time when we're bringing something everybody agrees with. Um, for those of you that have seen this particular area, um, to give a little bit of history, the, the pavement was intact 
prior to the building of the townhouses, the developers then took away the pavement um, while they were building the um, townhouses. And what we have left is basically a gravel surface um, with raised metal grating sticking out sometimes between two to four inches, um, lumps and bumps all over the place, and a surface that looks like something that uh, could be described by, by one resident as the surface of the moon. Quite frankly, it does nothing to actually help the actual area, that the whole road looks a mess, and, you know, I, I, the people have had to live with this for nearly a year. To make matters even worse, because of the uneven surface, it does nothing if you're trying to put your car on the drive. We've had at least two people that we're aware of that have, fought, that have fell up um, the um, raised gratings on the pavement and, and had sort of suffered minor injuries. We're very, very close to an old people's home at the top of the road, which means if anybody is um, being taken out on their electric buggy or in a wheelchair, they have to be pushed in the road past this section. And at night time, the whole area is quite dark and, quite frankly, is a trip hazard. Um, we understand that uh, TDC can't legally address the situation as presented and doesn't have enforcement powers to exercise. But we, uh, we also understand that the issue falls to Essex County Council to resolve and, as necessary, enforce the issue, and that Tendrin has asked Essex County Council to take the relevant action. We also know that they are working to resolve the issue. But quite frankly, I think they need to work a little bit quicker as this has taken well over a year and the whole situation is totally unacceptable. Um, I would thank officers from TDC because when we've looked at this plan application, I must stress that TDC's part of this application has been completed in full, um, which is basically from the back fence to the perimeter of the property ruling has been complied with. The issue is from the end of the, the driveway, basically, to the road, where everything's been left for nearly a year. Um, I would take this opportunity to thank you all for, for one, allowing the petition, and two, for allowing me to, to speak on behalf of local residents. And I would ask this committee to take whatever action they can to encourage Essex County Council to get a move on and fix this, uh, to fix this area for our residents. Because quite honestly, a year is long enough and we certainly don't want this dragging on till Christmas. Once again, thank you, Mr Chairman and Committee. Thank you very much. Well, we all saw the state of the road this morning, didn't we? Uh, Councillor Alexander. Thank you, Chair. First, Chair, I would like to, to give from Chris and myself and the residents of Nelson Road a profound thanks to, to yourself, um, Mr. Gulliver, and to you, our legal advisor. You really have gone a long way out of your way to bring this to this conclusion. And we hope that this is going to bring it to a conclusion. For one year, two months and three days, the people who have lived in these uh, townhouses nine in total have not been able to get in or out of their, uh, their, their, uh, their properties uh, without scratching the bottom of their vehicles. Um, you, know, you can see how it was left with repeated requests from ourselves and the research that you've done on our behalf. And now we've got it to this final conclusion mm -hmm. that we, this authority, it's responsible to that end of that pavement. And from that moment on, it falls under the umbrella of Essex County Council. And it's on that very point, Chair, I'd like to, to put forward a motion, uh, which if I may, I'll read in, in just a minute, but to say that I admire the people in them, houses and surrounding diffi uh, areas, the difficulties they've had with just mobility on that side of the road. There are two elderly folks' homes who use wheelchairs and have to cross the road to get down the other side because they can't go down their own road. So it's time now that we brought this to a conclusion. We've had enough of this now, haven't we? And I think everyone else has had it too. So 
Chair, may I, with your permission, either at this time or at later time during the meeting, uh, would you uh, accept this um, motion I'd like to put to the committee? Whenever you want to receive it. I Thank you very much for that. I'll take it that you are going to propose, but I'll take uh, one or two other speakers if, if they wish to speak before I take the vote. Uh, Councillor Harris. Uh, thank you. Um, can I just ask the officers? Um, I presume that this was a condition um, on the developer who built these houses to undertake and put the and, and build the, uh, the the pavement and the ramps for, for the vehicles, etc. I'm assuming that is the case because it normally is when when a planning application comes before us that they do the simple tasks like that. What the hell happened that they haven't actually done it? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Uh, yes, it's a condition to ensure that the the properties uh, have their individual accesses to the highway. Now that is via uh, the footpath, which is by way of drop curb. The, the bit that's missing from this equation is the licensing around the drop curb and the completion to a uh, tarmac state uh, of that footway. So in terms of what the, uh, what the council, Tender Industry Council, can take enforcement action against, uh, our powers don't extend to that area which is essentially outside of the, uh, the development and with the county council. So we actually have confirmation from the County Council that it is their responsibility. We understand that there are exchanges between the County Council and the developer uh, to ensure that, that those licenses are in place and that is completed. I think the concern has been how long uh, it's taken to resolve that issue and the fact that it still remains unresolved. So I'm not, I, I hear what you say, but TDC would have authorised the houses. Um, it, it would have been a condition for that to, to, to go ahead. Why haven't they done it? If that was a condition to make good the, the, the pavement, I know that falls under the jurisdiction of Essex County Council and highways, but why haven't they, they done it? Because they haven't uh, achieved the full agreement with Essex County Council on uh, the drop curb licensing and completion of the works. But they have provided access, so in terms of there is access to the properties, which is the condition. The bit that is missing uh, is the, the making up of the footway uh, to the standard that we would expect to see. So ju just to, to clarify, so is that a fault of the developer who just haven't done it, or was it the, the part of the condition that wasn't beefy enough to make them to do it, or is it Essex County Council that have just not got together with the developer? I, I just, just want who's to blame for it not to, to happen? Is it the developer, or is it Essex County Highways? Well, I think on this particular case, it, it's a bit of both because they are in negotiation and have been for quite some time. Uh, we need to really. Uh, get them to hurry on with this because this is becoming a matter of public interest quite clearly. Another quick question for you. It, we've already heard from one of the residents that, uh, and I think from the, the, from the ward councillor, who um, I must say, uh, you know, congratulations to the resident and all the residents that have got behind this. I mean, it, it's, it's, for me, it, it, it's so wrong that this was needed to have happened in the first place. And it's, it's a cause I should think to Essex County Council of an embarrassment that residents and the ward councillors have, have had to do this, but, but you know, well done for them to do that and to bring it to, to this committee's attention. And obviously, this is the first for us to see anything like this. Um, but but it, it's, I mean, it, it is a, a huge embarrassment that this hasn't been done. We've heard that it's a trip hazard. If somebody does fall over and hurt themselves. Who, who do they claim against? Essex Highways? Thank you. It would be an incident on the highway as a result of the state of the highway. Yes, it would be Essex Highways. Okay, I don't need to say any more. Just what the hell are they playing at? And, you know, bloody well, get on with it. it it's, uh, it's, it's simply outrageous that this hasn't happened. And when... Um, 
uh, Councillor Alexander makes a proposal. I'm very happy to, to second his proposal and his motion. And um, yeah, I, I don't think, as this is going out live and recorded, I don't think I can say what I really want to say. Um, but uh, you can just imagine. Thank you. Here you go. Thank you, Chairman. Um, interesting. I, I, I don't think we've ever had a petition come to this planning committee. Definitely not in the last, well, not since I've sat on it, and not in the four years between 2015 and 19. So this is interesting. Um, I'd just like to know where the county council has been in all this, is because is, that's the person that should be banging on at the county council and to the highways. If it's down to, and I, I'm with Councillor Harris. Um, that's probably the worst road in tendering, um, a, apart from one other, but I won't mention where that is because you could live in some of those potholes. But if we've conditioned something and we see it, don't we? We see it all the time that it says the county council highways say that their condition is that the developer will make good if they've done any damage or need to put anything right. And this hasn't happened in this instance. So, so I, I think, and I'm presuming, and I make a presumption, that there are discussions going on of how this will not happen again, so that we don't have to deal with this again, because we shouldn't have to, because it should be dealt with there and then. But, um, yeah, I'd just like to know if, it, if, if uh, what everything that Morris and, sorry, Councillor Alexander and Councillor Griffiths have done on behalf of their residents have the full support of the county councillor because that's who should be bashing Essex County Council always. Not physically, obviously, um, but he should be having a right old go at them saying, get this sorted out. A year and however many months it was is not acceptable in this day and age. Thank you. Councillor Placey and then Councillor Alexander. Okay, well, Councillor Baker has covered most of what I was going to ask, like where is the county councillor? And I thought that even if they didn't do the drop curb, they, they've got a duty to, 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 to reinstate the footpath, the, at least, um, to how it was. Um, I, I sympathise with you all. Keep, keep on fighting. It took me over two years, with the help of my county councillor, to get a footpath resurfaced where I lived before I was a councillor. Um, it's like it, Heavy was saying, what, what is happening here? It seems like there's been a, a bit of a game of ping pong, um, which is unacceptable. Um, and surely there is something that we can do to actually make Essex at least put it right for the residents and then fight the developers afterwards to pay for it, if that's the, if that's the problem. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, thank you, uh, panel, for your support in, in in this issue, because, as you say, this is quite unique. Um, this has never been before us before. So uh, what, what we're doing, in effect, is like a, a breaking new ground. Uh, we came to a stalemate, and the stalemate has been around for some considerable time. To point out that Councillor Griffiths and myself actually met with the developer or the agent of the developer who informed us that they had no intention of continuing the work because their financial backers have said there was insufficient funds. And I believe I'm correct and that's exactly what they said. We did not pursue this any further. Um, and indeed, the work hasn't been done. We're setting a precedent. So every developer that can just do this and leave the whole thing in such a terrible mess. We'll have it everywhere if we don't stop it now. And this is another issue that needs to be taken into consideration. We know a long time ago now, we sat on this committee and we agreed that at the completion of all work, it's to be left in the same condition as you found it, with all tidied up and ready to go. And they have failed in that for a start. Now, I take on board because I accept it's Essex County's problem now, along with the developer. But we must still, as an authority, 
have some input into how this progress is going along. Now, is that achievable? Can we still do that? So that's one one thing I'd like to know, that we can monitor it as it goes along. And the second thing I think it's most important is that we try to get some kind of a completion date. So the people who live there will have a target to aim for, because I think after 12 months, 14 months, it's now becoming something of, well, I think it's inhorrent. Um, I quite frankly, I feel quite ashamed that we've allowed it to get to this state. But I have the motion, Chair, if you're ready to accept that, I'm prepared to read it out. Is that acceptable to you? Yes. Uh, would you like to read it? I have a copy of it. Yes. I'll, over to you, sir. The motion reads that the planning committee instructs our district uh, director of planning to write formally to the portfolio hold res uh, holder responsible for highways at Essex County Council to escalate this matter with a view to a speedy and satisfactory resolution. So that's, that's the motion before you. Um, and I'll... Second, uh, would you care to add anything? I, 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 I did see sight of this earlier, so thank you to Councillor Alexander for, for showing me the, uh, uh, the proposed sort of motion there. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd be guided by our, our legal representative here as to whether we can beef it up a little bit rather than um, uh, you know, basically ask them to uh, escalate this matter. I think we should put in demand Demand Essex County Council Highways take enforcement action um, to bring about a, and to bring about a speedy satisfactory resolution um, as per the planning approval conditions or word to that effect. Um, I mean, just going back to what Councillor Alexander said, I mean, if it is a case that the reason why this hasn't been done, which is what I tried to get to the bottom of at the beginning of this debate, um, as to why it didn't happen. Is it because, and it sounds as though it is, that the, the developer has, has run out of money, has he gone out of business? Um, but if he's still able to... So he's still developing. So, uh, you know, if that is the case and it's proven, you know, should we have a name and shame? Name them who, who they are um, as to have not done this, because I'd like to know which developer hasn't... Uh, uh, done this and to um, you know it's simply outrageous if, if they're going to you know give the planning conditions a, a poke in the eye and say well actually I'll agree with all of this we've got our money we've sold the houses but guess what we're not going to pay to have the, the uh, pavement because that's what it seems to be the case so I think name and shame them but I'd like can we uh, basically can we beef this up and demand that they take action uh Councillor Harris, if you look on page 79 <clears throat> in the executive summary, it does just that in the first paragraph, names them. <laughs> so for, for the record then, it's Lane's Homes Construction Group, just so that the members watching at home can get that. Uh, Lane Homes Construction Group, if, I, if they can come across slightly. Yeah, sorry, just for you, Morris. Uh Lane Homes Construction Group, uh, the ones that have not carried this out and have left the pavement in a dangerous condition by the looks of things. Thank you. Just comment on that last. Thank, thank you, uh, Chairman. I, I think the idea of beefing it up or putting a bit more strength behind the motion, I think, uh, is something that we can do. Uh, some of the things that I could suggest, uh, which may help, uh, is that we refer within any correspondence to the fact that we have a significant number of local residents now who, with very good reason, uh, have demonstrated that this is a matter of greater public interest. Uh, than perhaps might be on the face of it as far as the County Council is concerned. And that it's causing a great deal of stress and uh, 
it's it's detracting from uh, the, the reputation of uh, councils to carry out their duties, really. So it's undermining the public's faith in uh, local authorities to, to carry out those duties. Uh, and it may well be that uh, we, we, we demand that the completion of the footpath is, is given a higher priority. Meeting the works is uh, so that we can report that back to this committee. Sorry, Chair, can, can I thank you for that? Um, can I just also request that we put the um, the health and safety, the real, very real health and safety risks, the like trip hazard, etc., that exist? Because you know somebody could fall over that tomorrow, um, and and you know it could break a hip and all sorts and change people's lives. So you know the urgency that this needs to happen now that you know we are aware, you know needs to needs to be. Uh, um, you know, underlined really. So, but I would be, you know, I would uh, um, be very happy for it. And obviously, um, Councillor Alexander is the, the proposer, but I'd be very happy for the officers to uh, come up with the uh, the word in. I mean, my proposal would be just get it done, but um, <laughs> I'm sure you put it better. Ch Chairman, can I suggest a short adjournment maybe so that the exact wording can be worked out and then we can come back with uh, as we would at full council with what's been sort of put forward. Otherwise, the the message isn't it, it, the exact wording may not be um, be right. Uh, um, I don't want to interject at this moment in time, um, and I agree with Councillor Baker. But I would like to just say, although um, I understand uh, fully where Mr. Guyver is coming from. Um, the idea of, that, of the stress factor, I do not think is material to this. What is material is the fact that it hasn't been done. And I think that is the stress point that we need to work on. We know how distressing it is because we live amongst it personally all the time. We know it. But what Essex highways don't know that because they don't live amongst it. So I believe that although I see where you're coming from, I wonder maybe it would be better if we just stood and we are targeted the fact rather than, uh, uh, than the, 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 the personal uh, assault on us. Might come up with a suitable addition to the suggested one, the wording. Um, rather than, as my vice chairman has suggested, that we adjourn for a few minutes, um, whether he can come up with something that would cover it, because uh, we are going out live, so I don't want to break that. Yes, Mr. Uh, chairman. chairman, I'm happy to work on some appropriate wording, which I can uh, run by yourself, Chair, and perhaps the proposer uh, following this meeting, so that I'm sure that I've got a, a clear steer as to what this letter is going to contain. Yeah. Right. Chairman. Yeah. Chairman, if that's the case, then then we, we can't agree to a motion that we don't know the wording to. Um, so the, the, the reason I suggested a short adjournment was so that we could get the wording exactly as the proposer, the seconder, the director of planning, who's going to put his name to it, um, and yourself can come up with a, the right set of words that we can all agree with and is then dealt with. That, that's what I suggest. Seconded. Right. Yeah, and a comfort break. <laughs> In that case, um, a couple of three minutes just to try and get the wording. And I'm going to ask the operator just to pause the live transmission while we do it. OK. Once, as soon as I get that signal that it is uh, um, a proposal. I hope he's got a copy of it there. It's typed up in front of him. 
Um, but I'm just going to ask the director if he would read through it so that everybody can know what we're saying. Thank you, Chairman. So this would be the, the resolution uh, of the committee in relation to this item, that the planning committee instructs our director of planning to write formally to the portfolio holder responsible for highways at Essex County Council to escalate this matter with a view to a speedy and satisfactory resolution. Bearing in mind, this is a matter that has been unresolved for many months and should have been concluded prior to occupation of the new homes. The letter will explain that there has been a strong petition from a significant number of local residents that with good reason demonstrate that this is a matter of great public interest, which is causing a great deal of local distress and which is undermining the public's faith in both their district and county councils in carrying out their duties. Furthermore, the state of the footway has given rise to genuine concerns about the safety of pedestrians and damage to residents' vehicles which could potentially give rise to claims against the highway authority as it falls within its duty to maintain the public highway. With the full support and backing of the members of this planning committee, the letter will demand that the completion of the footpath is given a higher priority and is resolved as a matter of urgency, utilising the available enforcement powers if necessary, and that this council is provided with an explanation of the current position and a timetable for completing the works, which can be reported back to the planning committee and to local residents. That's my example. Uh, with one small and um, very minor point I'd like to raise, um, I'm not dissatisfied with that, and quite the opposite. It's nicely constructed and penned. Um, uh, Bear in mind, right, that this has been un, uh, unresolved for many months. Uh, to my mind, in 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 its syntax, that that's colloquial and uh, unresolved for in excess um, in excess of a year would be a, a more of maybe of a formal way of putting that. Is that something you would consider, Mr. Gover? Well, Chairman, I'm happy to comment on that. Uh, and on the basis that building control certificates were issued for the completion in September 2021, then it will have been in excess of uh, a year. Uh, and I would be satisfied uh, from an officer perspective to alter the wording to unresolved for in excess of a year. And does that be with it? Before it goes any further, I'm going to take the vote. <laughs> and we will um, um, <laughs> we'll do this one again with a show of hands. And I think everybody can vote on this one. So uh, those in favour of that proposal, please show. <laughs> Apart from my choking, that is approved. And thank you, everybody, for taking part. And to the residents of Nelson Road, uh, thank you for bringing it to our attention. And you'll be free to leave now while we carry on with the last two applications, if you could. Thank you very much. Right, we, we're now moving on to planning application number 22, oblique 01088, full. This is 71 Long Road, Lawford. And I can only apologise to the applicant, Mr Lee Reid, who's been sitting very well, patiently and has got to go back to Sheffield tonight. So I'm sorry about that, <coughs> if you'd like. So we'll hear the officer's presentation, Mr. Lee, and then we'll, we'll um, Mr. Reid, I beg pardon, and then we'll uh, call you up. So the officer, Mr. Pingram, please. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, members. So this application relates to 71 Long Road in Lawford and seeks planning permission for the change of use of the property from its current residential use to a children's care home. 
which will provide care for up to, uh, up to five children between the ages of eight and 18. The use will include for between one and three staff members with up to three members of staff during the day, reducing to up to two members of staff during the night. No staff will live permanently at the property and instead will rotate on a shift basis. The change of use results in only minor external alterations with the ground floor garage being converted into an office, which will see the inclusion of a door and a window. Beyond the garage conversion, the layout of the building remains nearly identical, with the only change being the first floor bathroom being sub subdivided to account for the inclusion uh, of a staff bedroom. So in terms of the, um, the site, the application site is located on the eastern edge of Long Road. Um, the building itself is a two-storey residential dwelling served by five bedrooms. The character of the surrounding area is predominantly urban uh, with residential properties located immediately to the west and south. Um, to the east is a large parcel of open grassland, which you can see on the screen just there. The site falls within the settlement development boundary uh, for Lawford within the adopted local plan and lies adjacent to but outside of the Lawford conservation area. So I'll just run through some slides of uh, uh, photos of the site. So this is the site photograph facing the front of the property. I understand members uh, would have been there this morning, so they, they should be fairly familiar with this. But this is the uh, photo of the front. This is a photo looking east towards the property. Here's a photo um, of, of the rear garden area. And a second photo from the rear garden area, but looking uh, more towards the neighbouring property to the west, number 73. So in terms of the, um, the elevations, as, as I sort of touched on, there's very minor changes. Um, the, the, the front elevation you can see in the bottom left corner is a garage at the moment, um, and that is going to alter to just uh, having the door and window to serve the office, but otherwise no external changes. In terms of the floor layout plans, this is the existing, which just shows a standard five bedroom uh, dwelling house. Um, again, very limited um, changes to that layout. Uh, ground floor staying the same beyond the, the office that I previously just mentioned, um, but upstairs the bathroom um, you'll see here is just subdivided um, to become sort of half bar bathroom, half staff bedroom. So in terms of the assessment of the uh, the application, um, given the site's location within a settlement boundary set amongst the, um, uh, existing residential development, the proposal aligns with the requirements of policy LP10. The principal development is therefore considered acceptable um, subject to the more detailed considerations. Um, to the immediate west of the application site is number 73 Long Road, which is also a residential property. In addition, there are a series of residential properties located to the rear uh, of the application site along the Watergrave Close. The proposal will result in the use of the property by no more than five children, as well as between one and three staff members, so up to eight people in total. Given that the property is currently a five bedroom dwelling, it's perfectly reasonable to expect that a similar number of people could occupy the property in its current form. In respect to potential noise disturbances, there is a large rear garden area where it is acknowledged a degree of noise may be generated. However, there's no evidence to suggest that this noise would be a significant increase to that which could be generated uh, from the existing residential use of the property. Uh, while there will always be specialist on-site carers uh, to aid in the event of any noise-related incident. In addition, given the low number of staff members and children being cared for, officers do not consider that the comings and goings associated with the proposal would significantly increase from uh, what would be reasonably uh, expected from the existing house. Therefore, officers do not consider that the pro proposal would result in significant harm to the existing amenities of the neighbours. Essex Highways Authority have been consulted on the proposed development and have stated that they have no objections. The parking standards state that for such a use, there should be provision for one parking space per full-time equivalent member of staff, as well as one visitor space per three beds. As there are to be a maximum of three full-time equivalent members of staff and a total of five children, this means there is a maximum requirement for a total of five parking spaces. The site has a parking area to the front of the property, which is currently able to accommodate four parking spaces, and this arrangement will remain unaltered. While this provision does fall slightly below the standards, it is also acknowledged that the site is within a highly sustainable location, approximately 300 metres away from the, uh, the nearest bus stop. Given this, and, and um, that Essex Highways are offering no objections, officers do not consider that this minor shortfall uh, in parking provision is harmful enough to recommend a, a reason for refusal. The application site um, also lies adjacent to the west of the uh, Lawford Conservation Area. 
However, as the proposal um, results in only minor external alterations and is not actually within the conservation area itself, officers are content there will not be any harm to the character and appearance of that conservation area and therefore do not object on those grounds. So therefore, in conclusion, um, local plan policy LP10 supports the provision of care homes and extra care housing within settlement boundaries and accordingly the principal development is acceptable. Given the low number of users as a result of the proposal, there is not considered to be significant harm to neighbouring amenities, both through potential noise disturbances or through the external alterations. The site is adjacent to the conservation area, but the, minimum, uh, the minimal alterations to the building will not harm its setting. And also, as I said, Essex Highways are offering no objections. Um, so just to finalise, the application pr provides for slightly below the car parking requirements. However, due to the location being so sustainable, it's not considered this minor shortfall warrants recommending a reason for refusal. Therefore, um, uh, the planning application is recommended for approval. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Mr. Lee Reed, if you'd like to come forward, sir, use that microphone when you've got it switched on. Uh, You've got three minutes to convince us of your application. Ah, that always helps, doesn't it, technology? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for allowing me to talk in support of our application um, for 71 Long Road. Um, I don't know whether anybody's had an opportunity to perhaps look at a bit of background on us as an organisation, but we're a small independent provider of specialist education, schools uh, and children's homes. Our name's Kedleston as an overall group uh, and I'm one of the three executive directors of that uh, company. Um, what I'd like to just say is we, we operate currently 13 uh, schools and five children's homes. Um, of those five children's homes, they in total offer 24 uh, beds. Um, and in dealing and looking at uh, some of the concerns that perhaps have been uh, discussed with me this morning uh, during the site visit, um, I'd just like to say I, I did a bit of background research this afternoon and can confirm that only two uh, of the children that we currently are looking after uh, in any of our children's homes are in mainstream uh, schools currently. Uh, and indeed the two that are in mainstream schools um, have come to us already placed in those schools that haven't been placed subsequent to our placement. Um, it's important to note that all our children's homes are currently uh, registered obviously with Ofsted and have good ratings uh, and we consistently have good ratings on children's homes um, and our regulatory process is that we have to subject to uh, today the application being granted we then have to, to apply to Ofsted and fulfil their criteria for registering a children's home before actually we can open. Uh, and we also don't just open uh, and take five children straight away. We're very careful about the type of children we take so that they're naturally matched as best as possible, um, which obviously reduces any potential problems within the home. Um, I would like to sort of just um, thank the uh, planning case officer for um, the recommendation and, and obviously we accept the proposed recommendations that they've made within uh, the report um, and I hope that the visit today was useful for those who visited and uh, that I answered any questions that you had um, uh, accurately and uh, well. If you have any other questions, happily answer them. Thank you, Mr Chair. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Um, now, <clears throat> the ward councillor, uh, this was called in by two of the ward councillors, Councillor Guglielmi and uh, Councillor Coley. Councillor Coley's somewhat uh, got some ill health problems, which I don't know what they are, but he's asked that uh, if uh, Councillor Carlo would actually uh, take his own uh, period, which would have been five minutes, and Alan Coley has written a report as well. So I'm willing to accept it. I know Carlo uh, assures me that it will not be 10 minutes long, so I'll accept them both. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And uh, yes, it wouldn't be more than five minutes, probably combined. Uh, 
Yes, we, we asked for this application to uh, be determined by the planning committee because of the concerns we have and still have around the safety and the nature of the proposed use, uh, especially when the original planning space a statement was silent on nighttime supervision, daytime staffing levels, and that the children will be expected to cook, clean, look after the garden and be responsible for other, all other domestic chores. Section 2.2 of the planning statement clearly states, and I quote, that no staff will be employed for those tasks. Further information was subsequently received and posted on the council website to say that during the day, uh, between one to three staff will be on duty and that a further two will be there at night with one of them uh, asleep. The house is only five bedrooms, so where would the nighttime member of staff sleep? I believe there's been, the application has been updated, but it still shows on the plan as having only five bedrooms. The planning statement also talks about the proximity to primary and secondary schools, which have no available spaces, as this was another of our concerns. Again, further information was received that none of the children will be attending local schools, which is all well and good, but that would, it would mean that they would be attending specialist schools. In the district of Tendring, there are two specialist uh, such schools in the 15 mile, miles radium, Marketfield in Elmstead and Shawfield in Clacton, both of which are full. Uh, the third one uh, close to us is Lexington Spring in Colchester, which is a residential setting. So this application not only has not contributed any funding towards education, they will need to ship children out by taxis to other specialist schools miles away in our southern district, which is contrary to the statement page three in appendix two, where it talks about the vision for this particular proper site, education is sourced by local schools. Whilst we fully understand that this application falls both within national and our own planning policies, we do remain concerned about the low level of staffing that we will have to cope with the undisclosed mix of gender and age, the type of problems this child will have, and now that we reach the aims and achievement listed on page two of the appendix two of the planning statement. And now they will manage any potential promiscuous likelihood to develop between teenagers who come from different families. We also remain very concerned that notwithstanding the example given in appendix one of the planning statement of a child referred to as Michael, but later on as Sam, so I'm not quite sure whether there was a mistake there or not, with aggressive behavior towards his parents, he then embarked on a pathway to improve his problems. This proposal in front of you, we feel, is no more than another business venture to add to their portfolio. It's a poorly constructed application, Mr. Chairman, and the information submitted has had to be updated on several occasions. And the planning statement is still silent on what actual measure that will be in place to ensure the safety and the safeguarding of five young people with only up to three staff during the day and one plus one during the night. You will need to be totally satisfied with the safeguarding measures are fit for purpose. And if that's very much the case, then you will grant planning permission. But we sincerely hope that if this is granted, we will not give cause to uh, future regrets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was my presentation. If you like, I'll go on to uh, Council Coley's. Uh, members, you will need to be assured that if this application is granted, it will result in the provision of a safe environment for children with social, emotional and mental health difficulties, and that the premises are always adequately staffed and the use does not negatively affect the residents of the neighboring dwellings. We understand that that managing company, which would be responsible for providing the safe care of these vulnerable children, manage other establishments elsewhere. However, some of the online comments from staff members regarding these responsibilities are not always positive. The application seeks to accommodate up to five children with social, emotional and mental health difficulties in their domestic dwelling. These children will be aged between eight and 18 years. Assuming that age qualification in this application, men who have achieved their 18th birthday could they still be accommodated. What will be the status of this accommodation? Would children be accommodated under Section 17 and 20 of the Children Act or Section 20 of the Care Act or Section 20 of the Children's Accommodation Act? 
This application does not provide that vital information to give you the assurance that safety will be absolutely a, a, a priority. It is safe to assume that all applicants would endeavour to always have a full complement of children or youth residents, as they tell in the application, to ensure that uh, it's commercially viable. Therefore, we have some concern over the significant age gap proposed and the care of supervision, which will be essential an essential requirement. For example, the personal care needs, uh, needs and the level of support uh, or supervision in this circumstance it will be vastly different from an 18-year-old man and an 8-year-old little girl. Paragraph 6.4 of the officer's report states the staffing level will be, and I quote, between one and three staff members, with up to three members of staff during the day, reducing up to two members of staff during the night. Again, one of them uh, on, on, on a slave ship. We are concerned by the use of the words between one and three up to two. Unfortunately, between one and three and up to two can logically mean just one. It is vitally important to understand that is, if this is not explained in the application, what the actual member of employees for these premises will be. Is there to be an establishment of just three, which is indicated in the office report, and again I quote, up to three members of staff during the daytime, reducing up to two members of staff during the night time. So there could be one during the day and one sleeping during the night. We have real concerns about the staff ability to, uh, to safely provide the full range of personal care, social and emotional support and educational development required to both small children and adolescent youth. We are told that none of these children uh, will impact on the need for local school places as they require specialist school environment and will attend main, main, mainstream schools. We're not exactly sure whether these various specialist schools places will be secured as we couldn't identify them locally. Presumably these young uh, five people will be transported to and collected from various different establishments miles away during each day. So how will this be managed? With up to the three qualified staff, will carry out the transport of these children or adults, or will the individual in particular needs be taken by other trans means of transport? In addition, what happens when the uh, uh, accommodated youth reach the maximum age, which we presume will, could be 19? Would they be relocated elsewhere, or will 71 Long Road be transformed into an HMO? Members, before you approve this application, we ask you to satisfy yourself that the, chance, the change of use will result in a safe environment, providing adequate care and protection for all young people across the age included in this application. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, so, councillors, you've heard the applicants, you've heard the ward members, both of them, so it's question time now. Councillor Alexander. Thank you, Chair. Let me clear that over here. I'm trying to be naughty, look. Um, right. What I'd like to do, if I may, is to get some clarification because I'm a little bit confused. Um, I do have a personal uh, avenue into this because my wife works for such a company and um, works within the school system as not only as a teacher, but uh, in, in administration as well. Um, so my, my questions to you, if I may, is that this, this going around the, 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 the bedrooms, which I'm finding a tiny bit confusing. Now, we have said there's, there's two mainstream schools, so they will need tra a transport. Now, normally in homes, uh, police, uh, please correct me, that they will provide in-house transport by their own means, which means that they will either use a car that's in with the owner's consent and insurance attached to that, or they will have their own vehicles to to deliver. And 
the other, I'm not too sure what we said about the other three. Uh, can you confirm, will they be, uh, the other three would be in supportive uh, schools such as uh, special needs? Sorry, can I just clarify what you meant by the other three at the end of that uh, comment, please? Could you just clarify what you meant by the other three at the end of that? Stupid thing. Okay, right. Okay, so there's two in mainstream school. That means that three of them uh, will be uh, 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 going elsewhere. Yeah, just to clarify, I think there's been a bit of a misunderstanding there. I think um, in, in the uh, applicant's uh, comments, he was saying that throughout their whole business, across their 13 other uh, different sites, there's a total of two children that actually attend mainstream schools. So all the rest of the children do not. This particular application, there's no indication that there will be any children attending mainstream school. Right. So that means that five children will more likely be at school age, um, uh, we hope between eight, uh, unless they do um, uh, one to one, which I do. I believe that this company does not do, um, will have to be moved in the mornings and taken to the appropriate schools in that area. And we've already been told by uh, Councillor Giuliani where those school systems are which means that at some stage the, there will be cars moving from that property, which then is the point I'm trying to make. You say that uh, at the moment I, I looked at that, you can't put a motor vehicle right on top of a front door. So that restricts that down to, as you say, four, uh, four, four parking spaces. But if you're on um, a staff, of three staff, um, unless they share vehicles, that's vehicles coming in because unless they live very local. And then you've got uh, school uh, vehicles as well. I'm not sure <clears throat> uh, where these are all going to park. And I'm, could you sort of give us some idea on the, uh, the, the maps where they might park? Yep, so to answer that last bit, the, 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 uh, the first point to note is that the parking is to the front of the site. Um, in terms of the parking requirements, as, as I've outlined in my report and my presentation, yes, there is a shortfall, a minor shortfall in officers' opinions um, of four spaces rather than the five that would be required. Um, officers are weighed up um, for the reasons that I've sort of outlined, i.e. that um, it's in a sustainable location within a settlement boundary, there's a bus stop within 300 metres, Essex Highways Authority have not objected we don't see um, the significant harm that, um, with the minor shortfall to recommend a reason for refusal. Um, the situation that you sort of outlined in terms of um, all staff being there, um, that would also ensure that the, um, the, the, the children are being visited at that same time as well. So I think it's, un, you know, I can't say for sure how this will work, but it's, it's unlikely that that would be a regular occurrence. It would be quite a rare event where there would be the need for that space. So it's the maximum requirements would be five, and we're just that short for on a, on a yeah in in maximum terms. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Um, so well, let's go back to the actual uh, accommodation, which is this one here, if I may. There are five bedrooms. Now, are you ta are they in going the intention that it's a tandem then, because. To, to my knowledge of this, if you're working waking nights, then there is a room with uh, 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 some small sleeping accommodation. Where, what provision has been made for the night staff? Yep, so, um, so basically there's a, uh, two members of staff overnight, um, and basically how it works is that one will stay, if you see on the screen here, you can see, I'm not sure how clear it is for you, but on the first floor, the bathroom is subdivided into half a bathroom and, and half is um, now a staff bedroom. So my understanding of how the operation will work is that one member of staff will be on, on duty, essentially, and the other member of staff will be asleep in the staff bedroom, but on call in, that, in the event of being required. A waking night, okay. Um... Is this, will we be looking at a mixed gender 
um, uh, type of score? Uh, I can't answer that. The end users are not known at this point, so can't answer that. Interesting to to note that Councillor Guglielmi also pointed out that you've got to be careful of running into what it's almost an HMO. Um, I researched that, funny enough, this afternoon, and the recognisable age to start an, H, uh, an HMO 16 years old. Um, but I know the school system, and I know that they would be able to very carefully select who would go in. You don't put an eight-year-old, I hope, with an 18, you know what I mean? That would, I don't see that happening. So um, we're, we're, once again, we're looking at what might be. We're, we don't know who's going there. We don't know what the uh what the nature of the uh, of the client will be um so uh i i don't honestly see how in this area um that this is going to work so full and so satisfactory could you um give give us an idea of the uh, for example the fire um uh, there's nothing in here about fire or nothing fire rates um, does that come under a different scope to us? Yeah, so to answer that last point, uh, it's just a conversion, this application, but they will need to go through building control as well. So that would be a matter that would be addressed at that stage. In terms of Who's going to be the end occupiers? Yes, I can't sit here and tell you the exact end users because I don't think anybody knows at this stage. I think it's it's the principle of having five children there. Um, but what I can say is that there is a condition recommended that it will be a maximum of five children. Um, and so we, we know from the submission that these children will be between the ages of eight and 18. Um, and, and looking on the website of, of the Kedderson Group, it appears to be children like with, with autism and, and those kind of needs. But more specific than that, I can't really answer that because we just don't know. It's, we're, not, we're, not, uh, we're not recommending um, specific users. We're, we're just looking at a, a, a use for, for up to five children. One last thing, Chair, and then I'll give way. Um, okay, so the thing that struck me throughout the agenda, per se, is that there is very little comment from anyone who lives in the immediate area. I believe that the, the local Paris council at the beginning and basically in favour and then seemed to change their mind as time evolved. Okay, so um, are you happy and contented as as the planning, uh, our planning authority, with, uh, and we lean on your your advice? Are you happy that this will have no adverse effect? and consider that there may be need as legislation evolves to expand what is existingly there um, to take into consideration another area. And I believe there's something in the pipeline right now um, that, there, that this will not have an adverse effect on the street scene, on the people who live in that road. I speak for them without their knowledge, of course. And also that the long term on this um, uh, will be secure. Yep. So I think um, within my officer report, I go for all of the key considerations from a planning perspective. You mentioned the street scene. Um, there's going to be limited uh, external changes. So yes, content from that perspective. In terms of neighbours, um, as, as I've said in my in my report, there will be a degree of noise from from the garden, but there would probably be a degree of noise in a five bedroom property and the users that would, would use that anyway. And officers have got no evidence before them that would suggest that this would be a significant increase to what um, the current situation could be. In addition, there's on-site uh, staff that, can, um, that are trained to deal with any particular noise related incident. Um, and also in terms of the vehicular movements, we don't see that that's gonna be an, ex uh, uh, an excessive increase to what is already um, occurring or what could occur. So. Yes, for all of those reasons, we are content that from a planning perspective, the um, 
the application is rec uh, worthy of being recommended for approval, hence my recommendation. In terms of the long term and concerns about an expansion, I go back to the recommended condition uh, number three, which limits it to five children. So anything sort of beyond that, um, yeah, that would need to be uh, applied for. And I know earlier I didn't get to answer this point, but you mentioned about potential concern about turning to HMO. Again, that's not what's being applied for here. That would be that would need to be uh, the subject of a separate planning application, which would be determined on its merits at that time. Thank you. Right, uh, Councillor Harris, and then Councillor Guglielmi. Thank you, Thank you Chairman. Um, just to, to clarify, um, in the report it says that Lawford Parish Council were provided no comments, and then this evening we were given some comments from Lawford Parish Council. Um, just to confirm, they've, they've, they've bullet pointed four things here. Can you confirm whether they are or they're not planning uh, issues? So number one is concerns regarding the level of staffing and the impacts on the safety of children concerned. Is that a planning consideration? Please. Yes, Councillor Harris. Yep. The, the first point, uh, the answer is yes. yes. Um, the second point, um, in terms of gender, no, but in terms of age, yes, that's kind of covered in the report um, and, and forms a key pace, basis of what's being proposed. To respond to the point about the, uh, the Law for Parish Council, it's my fault actually looking at it, I haven't made it clear on the update sheet that these comments were actually only received this morning. So um, they, they did originally provide no comments, but we, we just received them today. But I haven't actually made that too clear on the update sheet, so apologies. Hello. Um, so the age of the children is a planning condition. Uh, the impact on neighbours with increased comings and goings. Is that a planning application? Yes. That issue. Yep. Okay. And the pressure on local schools, which are already at capacity. Sorry about this. Yeah, so a bit of a tricky one, but yeah, we think that that is uh, that would be a, a planning consideration. Um, the comments, uh, what, what are the comments with regards to Essex County Council in terms of education? Um, would they not be the sort of the the the, the, the expert um, that we would revert to in any any planning application? So, what are their views in terms of um, the schooling and also um, do, do we have any um, you know, uh, uh, comment from Essex County Council social care as well would, would there would they be involved in this or would they be an expert that would be involved maybe if, if not at this stage moving forward would they be involved at that stage and then what 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 would they govern Yes, yeah, so to answer the first point, um, I, I did consult Essex County, the schools department, and they come back with no comments, which isn't unexpected because that's normally in relation to the sort of bigger schemes that they, they more get involved in. Um, with them and, and, and social care, I, I believe that's not, for this point, that would be moving forward. To, you know, if we were minded to recommend um, approval, then the applicant would need to work with Essex County Council in that regard. Okay, well, I mean, there. You know, it has been mentioned about the, you know, the, con the concerns of the children in terms of how many members of staff there, there are, etc. Um, am I right in saying that that would be taken care of really by um, either Essex County Council Social Care um, or, and or Ofsted? Um, would they be, you know, so even if we, this, this committee were mindful to approve this, um, that it, they, those organisations would need to be satisfied that they meet all the required standards. 
I think the short answer to that is yes, that would be, yeah, post any decision, if you know, if it was to be recommended for approval, then yes, they would need to meet offset, etc. Um, one thing to note is that the staffing levels that are being um, outlined within their supporting statement, they do outline that that is fairly standard for this type of, of use. And while one to three members of staff might not seem a huge number, we are only talking about a maximum of five children here. So officers are content that that is uh, sufficient. In, in, in terms of, you know, a, a valid point, and, and I know that it's just been mentioned, but HMOs um, are a, a real concern. Are there any uh, conditions where this could result into uh, a HMO by accident um, if it's not the intention to happen um, at some point in the future? And if that is the case, can that be conditions where it doesn't happen or there is no need? We, we, it will only be for children up to a certain age, which is what we're, we're looking at today. Yeah, I mean, I can only really sort of reiterate what I said before in terms of if it, become, if it was a HMO, then that would be a completely different use to what's being applied for here. So it would be, if it was a HMO use, it would be in breach of, of any planning permission that was granted. And as such, we would then need to um, assess any future application for a HMO on its own merits at that time. But yeah, it would be in breach of any permission that would, might be granted tonight. So just to clarify, this cannot morph into a HMO. So those fears we can put aside that that that, that could happen. And if it did, there'd be action that enforcement action that the TDC um, could could take. Um, okay, just, just to confirm, this is a five bedroom house, and as it is at the moment, where you know there's no restriction on the number of children or people who could live in the property at the moment, nor uh, how many vehicles can be stored on the the front parking sort of area yeah so in answer to the first point yes there's no restrictions in the number of users there in terms of parking for a residential property with two or more bedrooms you only need to provide for two spaces but yeah there's no restriction saying they can't they can't have more okay no no further questions thank you thank you councillor goodley yeah one important question which you um as you know where it is, it's right on a main road with a field right next door to it and a path that goes through to the local play area and to the housing estate behind it. Um, is there anything on this saying that they are going to have to have gates? Because this, this, their park, parking and their house leads straight onto a main road, a very busy main road, and there are no gates there. So if a child of eight escaped or something, wanted to get out onto the, want to get out because of various things happening to it there is no way of preventing that child going straight out onto the main road so is there really going to be any provision that they have to put gates onto the front of this house thank you yeah the, the short answer to that is no there's not provision for gates and there's not recommended to be provision for gates my, my response to that would be that it's an existing residential property that could have eight-year-olds or whatever um in its current use so there's, there's no difference in, in in that respect that could happen now or it could happen with the proposed use what i would add is that probably with the proposed use there, there might be less chance of that because there is there are specialists on uh, trained on site staff at all times see what i hear what you're saying but these are children that are not coming from the area they don't know the area and they some of them might not actually want to be there they might actually want to be in their home environment where they were before so they might the children are very clever they might like to think they know where they are or want to get escape but there is no gates on the front of that house and as they it backs onto a it backs it goes onto a main road and the side goes onto a field Ch chairman if I, if I may I, I can provide a little bit more cl clarity in in addition to what um michael said so um it, it's a it's obviously a very specialist use um that's proposed there that's on the table tonight um so in addition to what michael said the um the operator of they, they will be best placed to to make that judgment in terms of um, those potential future issues there is also um an allowance under the general permitted development order which allows you to have gates up to a certain height um which is um i think it's two meters uh, well, sorry, one meter directly adjacent to a highway. Again, it's, there's no gates proposed as part of this proposal. However, there is provision under the general permitted development order to erect gate, 
gates if it's not immediately directly adjacent to a highway which a highway which i believe this is not you can actually go up to two meters isn't it um so that that is a consideration that you can that you can um, have regard to thank you chairman thank you yes i would i would like that as a consideration because the, there are more and more houses as you probably aware that we have two estates being built right opposite where that is and there's more and more houses and more and more traffic so and these are people coming from outside the area they're not people that live in lawford that know the area so i would like the gates um put on there as a provision thank you um yeah just to answer that i mean while i note your comments we have an application before us in its current form this is what's here to be determined we've weighed up as officers um and we, we don't feel that the provision of the gate would make it acceptable as opposed to refusal so this is where we're at this is this is the application so really we do need to be assessing what is before us councillor baker thank you chairman just um <clears throat> one question at the moment i do have some comments but they can come out during the debate um condition three which um a maximum of five children um it doesn't state the ages although we've had that in the report that, that they are going to be between age and ages 8 and 18 should that not be actually specified in that condition or would that be um, dealt with in another way thank you thank you councillor baker yeah I, I agree with you um I, I don't imagine there'll be too much objection to this but we could um amend the, the wording of the condition to make reference to um a maximum of five children between the ages of eight and 18 if that if if, if the committee are minded to recommend so thank you nothing further at the moment clarify that chairman that, that that is on the basis that that is in terms of that part of the proposal that is what is um applied for and that, that is what was put forward to us by <clears throat> by the applicant so I, I we don't think it's unreasonable to add that to the condition councillor alexander <clears throat> um i was interested to read on page 59 and 6.28 uh, somewhat down, uh, we were talking about car parking before, and it said the site falls slightly below the car parking provision. Um, and yet, I was under the understanding earlier that it seemed, is, is that been amended now? Uh, is, is that acceptable now that there is enough car parking for that area? Thank you. I think I've already covered this, but basically, yeah, we're one short um, of the, the parking standards provision, but officers have weighed up the, for the reasons I've already outlined and come to a decision that that isn't harmful enough to recommend a reason for, for refusal. Well, thank you for covering it before, but forgive me, I'm slightly senile. Um, okay. Um, the thing that's bothering me slightly and that was a point of asking that, incidentally. The thing that's concerning me that we have a corn village and respite place for the kiddies, which is wonderful. And then there is another area next door. And there seems to be something almost like a sprawl um, in, in, in this field. Now, that, that, that has somewhat concerned me, the amount of this as it's creeping along that particular road. And on top of that, there's 400 properties about to be built, or 300 plus nearly four, um, which in my mind would take that from, um, I was always informed that the moment planning of admission is done and everything is signed out, 106 is the whole ball of wax. It then goes on and then it becomes a positive um, application. And then it's considered in our five-year housing agreement. So here it says it, that it is a small, considered to be a small area. I don't see that with so many houses that are tucked around it. Um, there are areas of this that concern me greatly. For example, uh, we spoke about the fence. Um, surely there would be a, 
a, a double lock system on the door with an alarm. Remember, the art of these is to not let people out, nor in. It's one of them jobs. It's uh, on lockdown or semi-lockdown. Um, so I don't know whether that's applicable. Um, but apart from that, um, what would you say, this is my last question, what would you say the impact on a conservation area would be? Yep, to answer that last point, um, yeah, it's, it's adjacent to the conservation area, but on the grounds that the uh, the external alterations are incredibly minor, just a slight alteration to the ground floor garage area, um, given that, and that it um, does not actually fall within inside this uh, conservation area because of those reasons, no, no harm to the character and appearance of, of the area. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Chair. Um, what was described to us today by by the uh, by the applicant was um, a description of a, a a service which, whilst they haven't fully identified the children that are going to go in there yet, is actually a a facility that is sort of warm, um, welcoming, um, a, a an environment where children that have let's say got difficult times or issues we don't know what and we never will know nor should we know but that, that you know that are um be, you know being encouraged to um perhaps go by transport themselves i think it was described at some point uh, certainly but you know th this is certainly not prison um with with double locks or high fences um this this is this is um um, this is a, 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 a that's not what, what I would view this. This is this is a, an establishment um, which is providing uh, a community service in terms of um, individuals that need looking after and help. Um, that's the way that I see this. In in terms of you know double locks, I don't see that. I mean, again, that would be an issue for me for Ofsted for Essex County Council Social Care. Those are the experts that would be able to advise um, whether that that kind of thing is necessary. I doubt whether it is, but I'm not an expert, so I can't really put any comment on that. And in terms of gates, even if you put a two meter gate, knowing you know when my son sons were eight years old, that wouldn't have been a barrier to them. They would have been straight over that. Um, and th then I, I'm not sure how, even if you said they've got to have gates, I'm not sure how you would enforce it that they would be kept closed at all times. And sure, eggs are eggs. The moment that it's left open, if somebody's intent on getting past it, whoosh, that's the moment they'll get past it. So I'm, I'm not so sure where the, the sort of the security aspect is, is coming. Have, have I got that right? Or what would the officers like to comment on that, please? Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Basically, what you just said, I fully reiterate. Yeah, that's completely accurate. That is correct. Uh, I was going to just say that the the class, the use class that the application is under, and I'll stand corrected you know, by my planning colleagues if I'm wrong, is C2, which is um, residential institutions, which is for the use use for the provision of residential accommodation and care to people in need of care, and that's defined in the use classes uh, order. And uh, the the residential institutions that are secure fall within a completely different use class, which is C2A. And the obviously the the, the class of this application will be will be in the description of the development, so it will be absolutely clear. If you grant permission, what use class will be applicable, which is defined? Um, I must admit, when I saw the uh, application, I was reminded I've been on this committee too long. Um, uh, but where we actually um, granted the permission several years ago, which in hindsight, perhaps we shouldn't have. This seems totally different to me. It fits in well with LP10, which uh, supports the provision of care homes and um, within the settlement boundaries. 
Uh, we heard this morning that this is not going to be a locked premises, which was where we went wrong in the first place. Um, and it's a job to judge, my understanding, to judge who the five, I'll call them lucky, um, children will be. In certain cases, they'll be lucky to get away from the premises that they're in at the present moment, and it will provide a good home. Um, as far as the conservation area goes, the only difference in the conservation area is going to be an additional window in the front elevation. So uh, I think the SP7 is well satisfied by this. And while I've been carrying on, Councillor Harris is uh, in the country. I, I'm quite happy to propose acceptance um, in, with this um, application. Um, you know, I, I haven't got, I understand some of the concerns, um, but um, I, I feel that, again, harm versus uh, benefits, the benefits greatly outweigh any any potential harm and it is potential harm and hopefully there won't be any harm but um you know i i see this as a um a much needed service in our community we are a growing community and the needs of items and facilities like this uh, are going to be ever more sadly um but um i think I, i'm i'm happy to propose and also with the um the comfort that Ofsted and Essex County Council social care will be sort of the, the overriding governing body that will ensure that everything else, um, systems, children welfare, etc., will be looked after. And also with the comfort that this is an experienced company that has a, a track record of other, I think five other establishments and 13 schools um, as well. So my, acceptance, uh, my proposal is to accept, thank you. Um, Chairman, I'm quite happy to second Councillor Harris, but I have got a couple of comments to make. Um, I've heard that um, a couple of councillors, obviously, well, more than two, have, have concerns about it. Um, if, if we give planning permission, and that's not a given, the company still have to go to Ofsted. Ofsted can go around and say no. So it fails there. Ofsted will keep, I'm sure, and I hope that they keep a strict eye on such establishments. We hear all the time in the press about other places that maybe they haven't done what they should do. It's five children. I compare it to the houses, uh, and Councillor Alexander mentioned it, Acorn Village. There are at least two houses, one in uh, Long Road, further down the road, that um, looks after adults with learning disabilities. There's one in the middle of Manning Tree, and they have similar staffing. These are children who deserve the same um, chances that those adults have got and do have and are very well looked after. And the local community know them all, and they see them all the time. Um, so I'm quite happy to, to second it. And like Councillor Harris says, that they are going to be looked at. They will be governed. Um, and, you know, let's give these young children a chance. So I'm quite happy to second, provided we put in that extra part into Condition 3 about the ages between 18, eight, sorry, 18 and 8, 8 and 18. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak before I take the vote? As I've got a proposer and a seconder. No, in that case, you know what you're um, voting on. It's the recommendation printed on page 54 um, with the conditions that are on page 60 and the addition to clause 3 of the years 8 to 18. Um, so clause 3 will read... <coughs> The use thereby permitted shall operate with a maximum of five children to reside uh, at the property at any time. So it will be the maximum of five children aged between eight and 18 to reside at the property at any time. 
proposer and seconder happy with that arrangement? Yes, proposer. Just just one question. Eight, what happens if there's a seven-year-old that needs assistance um, and they want to put somebody in there? Is, is there a, does there need to be a, a lower age? The reason I suggested eight to 18 is because that's in the papers and that's what the applicant has stated. So if that needs to be amended, for any reason, then they can come back and apply for a, a variation of condition. That's that's fine then. Okay, thank you. Of hands. Um, so, uh, Councillor Alexander. Abstain. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Baker. Four. Councillor Codwing. Four. Councillor Guglielmi. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Placey. Four. Councillor Wiggins. Four. And mine will be four as well. So by my reckoning, we have one, two, Three, four, five, six in favour, two abstentions. Therefore, this application is approved subject to the minor recommendations in Clause 3. Thank you very much. We will move on. And uh, Mr. Reid, all I can say, apologies again for drawing it out. And I wish you well if you are driving back to Sheffield tonight. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, we, um, we move on to A3, which is application 22 stroke 010414. This is an application uh, at, of land at three on Parts Lane, Ardley. And I think Mr. Yarsma is getting this one. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, indeed. Um, the proposal is for the erection of a three-bedroom bungalow in lieu of a prior approval for um, a three-bedroom dwelling, subject of application 22-517, um, change of use, notification, two knots. Um, and it's along um, the site is on Hearts Lane, Artley. So it's... Um, Hearts Lane is a is a characterful country lane. You you will remember it. You've spent time there this this morning. You've also spent a bit of time there last month. Um, so this is towards the um, the eastern end of of Hearts Lane. Um, so the site in question is on the slide there, um, outlined in red. The the wider site um, benefits from. Um, various prior approvals as well as planning permission. So it's, it's got a very, very um, lengthy and somewhat detailed planning history. However, it's, a sim it's actually quite to simplify matters. The, the site as a whole, um, that when I say the site as a whole, I mean the, um, you know, the red line area as well as the, the blue line area that benefits from um, either prior approval and or planning permissions for up to um, five dwellings. Um, so in terms of prior approvals, the site benefits from a prior approvals for up to five dwellings and the, the site at the moment actually already benefits from planning permission for up to four dwellings. So, trying, you know, so in terms of what you're looking at here tonight is the fifth dwelling. So it's a planning, um, a, a proposal for planning permission in lieu of the, the fifth and final prior approval. Um, so that, that basically that that's, that would be it in terms of the site, um, in terms of the in lieu of um, situation. So the site in question is that L-shaped um, area there. Um, the proposal is to uh, build the dwelling, uh, a single story, a single bungalow there instead of the um, um, the, the conversion that was uh, obtained as part of the 
the change of use prior approval. That's the block plan of the site shown in context with surrounding existing dwellings and um, dwellings to be built. So just quickly, Three Elms is there facing um, Hearts Lane, and then you've got the two existing bungalows that you would have seen on site today. And then there's two um, more more dwellings to be built in, in depth behind the proposal, which is plot five. And the proposal will very much mirror um, the appearance of, of the existing two bungalows on site and the other two to be built, as you can see there on the elevations. Uh, this is in detail the, the proposed floor plan. So it will contain three three bedrooms, uh, a kitchen, dining area, and a lounge, as well as a centrally located uh, bathroom and an ensuite to bedroom one, and then the hallway here in, in the center of the floor plan. Moving on to photographs, this is the existing building, the existing chicken shed that benefits from the prior approval to a three bedroom dwelling, albeit a conversion. So the proposal is to demolish that and construct this um, bungalow in its place. And that's another um, angle of the existing building to be demolished. And this is just swinging around, looking back towards the those two bungalows already on site uh, as you come down the, the um, access lane. Um, and this that's the front of the the relevant part of the um of the site so we have um those uh the detailed planning history um there's no late representation documents um re relating to this item the the key and most important material planning considerations are outlined in the report and members are requested to consider officers recommendation Actually, there's one update. Um, the The report mentions the unilateral undertaking is in the process of being completed. I've been informed that that's actually now completed, already signed and ready to go. Thank you, Chairman. That's it for me for now. Thank you very much. And uh, for public speaking now, uh, Ms Foley. Ah, and welcome. And when you're settled and got your microphone live, so you've got uh, three minutes. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, councillors. There are a few points that I'd like to raise in relation to the determination of the application. A legitimate fallback position is clear that the former poultry shed could be converted under Class Q of the GPDO, which was granted by the Council in May this year. This permission cannot be revoked, and there is a very real prospect. There is a very real possibility that these works could be undertaken to convert the building into a dwelling. Case law at the High Court and the Court of Appeal have accepted submissions that there were three elements to the fallback test. Firstly, whether there is a lawful ability to undertake such a use. Secondly, whether there is a likelihood or real prospect of such occurring. And thirdly, that a comparison must be made between the proposed development and the fallback use. In relation to point one, there is a lawful ability to undertake the change of use following the Council's approval of the Class Q in May. For point two, there is a real prospect that the conversion of the building being undertaken within the Class Q parameters. Finally, the officer's report recommending approval has provided a comparison for the proposed development and the fallback use. The Council is satisfied that all three tests can be met and thus significant weight should be attached to the fallback position. These tests were also confirmed by the Council when approving the other four dwellings. You will have noted that the proposed ridge height sees an increase from that of the existing building. The design is identical to the approved for the two new build dwellings soon to start construction located north of the application site. This design retains and mirrors the character and appearance of the immediate area, negating a squat appearance of a slack roof for this proposed dwelling in the rural residential vernacular setting. 
Despite this increase, there is a reduction in the floor area of seven square metres and the number of bedrooms is to remain the same. I would like to raise concern with condition 12 proposed by the council, advocating for the removal of the householder permitted development rights. This condition was not imposed on the four approved new build dwellings in lieu of class Q approvals at the site. The PPG is clear that the blanket removal of freedoms to carry out small scale domestic and non-domestic alterations that would otherwise not require an application for planning permission are unlikely to meet the tests of reasonableness and necessity. Finally, queries were raised by the councillors in relation to a silver birch tree within the application site. Although the tree is not protected by any mechanism and the council's tree officer is not opposed to the removal, the tree can be retained and incorporated into the scheme. A condition to this effect would be appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, councillors, question time. Um, yes, Councillor Harris has indicated. I'm not sure. I've got too many questions, actually. Um, it, this might morph into a uh, just debate and and discussion, really. Um, but feel free, anybody that wants to jump in with any questions. Um, I mean, firstly, the good news: the birch tree is going to be kept. Um, that's that's great. Um, th this, and I, and I speak in a sort of a wider. Um, sort of point really is that I, for me personally, I find this this whole sort of class Q um, situation, and then you know gets prior approval to convert a chicken shed, um, um, whatever it might be, uh, a derelict barn, a derelict shed. Um, you know, it's becoming more and more common, and it almost seems from what we've seen that it it's part of a process which happens, call it a loophole or whatever, but this is what we're, we're seeing and what we're face, facing now. And uh, the react, I mean, we saw one not so long ago where the thing was held up by straps. I mean, how on earth, you know, that got uh, uh, some form of, uh, well, I think, it, I mean, we turned it down in the end, but I mean, it was, it was dilapidated. And I think that, you know, when when the the class Q gets permitted or you know the permitted uh, prior approval uh, permission gets gets authorised, you know we almost need to sort of say, well, actually, look, they're going to build a house or a, a bungalow because they're going to come back, and it seems like a, a step. So for me, you, the government either need to just change the rules and just say, well, okay, you can you can you can plan and, and put these bungalows on, just cut out the uh, the game that's going to be played. Um, or we stick and we play this this sort of game because that for me personally that's what it, it seems, um, and so you know I think that personally I don't think there's anything we can do about this. Um, for me, it's it's not in keeping with the area. We we we've been down that that long um, uh, avenue pathway, whatever you know that that track, um, and all the houses along there are fairly large, and this is out of keeping. And the, we've got this development, which is in the middle of nowhere, which has appeared piecemeal, bit by bit. Um, and for me, it, it's not right, but it's within the rules and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and, you know, whilst I think that there's nothing wrong with the bungalows, I think mean, they're lovely. Um, I think if you buy one and, and you happen to live there, I think that's great as well. And, you know, the saving grace is that there's some plenty of mature trees around it, which means that most people won't see it. Um, but it's outside the the red line. I don't, you know, and so I, I think I haven't really got too much to say other than I think it's for officers and for this committee to take a very long, hard look at applications that come in the future for any uh, class Q adaptions of, of sheds, shacks, chicken houses, rabbit hutches, guinea pig hutches, whatever that may be. Um, that come before this committee, um, but I don't. I don't see there's anything we can do in this instance. And I think the the uh, the applicant who spoke there is, is perfectly correct in, in what what she was saying. So um, I've got no more to say than that. Thank you. 
right, we're uh, building quite a list now, which is good. Uh, my question will be when I've got the officer's attention. <laughs> the uh, applicant raised something which I wasn't aware of. And that was a question of the removal of the uh, general development. Um, perhaps it shouldn't have been raised, but nevertheless it was. So um, I'd like the officer's views on this, please. Uh, so um, condition 12, um, it's basically a condition. It, it's, I think the first thing to, to keep in mind is this this is an officer recommendation in front of you. You know, you, you are entirely within your right as a committee to actually debate the, the overall recommendation as well as the condition. So it's, con it's a recommendation in front of you. Um, so condition 12 effectively removes um, permitted development rights um, under that schedule. Um, so that's under classes A, B, C, D and E. Now I think I think um, the thinking behind that was that this is obviously the fifth dwelling and, you know, we kind of reaching capacity here. However, um, looking at that condition, um, you know, the me members can, can consider that I th um, potentially. I think that was mainly aimed at preventing outward expansion of this dwelling. However, uh, the speaker, the agent, made, made a reasonably st um, strong argument in terms of um, other, I, I, I believe she's right, in terms of um, other approvals did not include that condition. And also the plot five is, as you can see there on the on the screen, it, it is the biggest plot. <laughs> so so those are the things members can take into, into account. Um, yeah, I think I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I have got a question, but I'm not sure that I'll get the answer that I want. But <laughs> um, the renewable energy, um, it's, where is it? Well, uh, PPL 10, um, that we, we can look at measures including electric car charging points. Are we any further along the, the, the road with solar panels on new premises, given the current situation? Um, well, I think I think in terms of that, that condition and in the context of a, a proposal like this, I think we will always be looking for a, for a suite of measures. Um, and there's obviously the, um, the, the, build, the building uh, regulations regime as well. So as a starting point, we'll always look for for properly insulated dwellings, um, and that's where the building regulations comes in. Um, again, members members can debate that. Um, this is one dwelling. Um, the yeah, it's, uh, there is potential for for members to consider or debate the, the, the specific inclusion of, of a condition asking for a renewable energy, energy generation plan. Um, I don't believe that is in the recommendation, but you know that can certainly form part of the, the, the debate and potential a revised um, motion or a revised recommendation. Fall. Um, with regard to the settlement development boundary and condition 12 because if their back gardens fall outside the, the settlement development boundary then surely they would need planning permission to put an extension on am, am I correct in that thank you so so the, the site in its in this the, the the wide the biggest site in its entirely in its entirety falls well outside the settlement development boundary. Um, so I think that's the first thing to, to just bear in mind. And then um, 
in in terms of the uh, you know how that feeds into the whole um, general permitted development rights concept. Um, so the the in, in in this context the the um, the the the, the um, how can I put this uh, that the whole principle of of development um, is is in the context of new new residential dwellings. So extensions to to existing residential properties um, are actually um, in principle at a high level principle um, acceptable outside the settlement development boundaries. Sorry, it took me a while to get there, but yeah, <laughs> we got there in the end. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, right. Uh, you can see that I've always been that. I've read this earlier and I was quite taken aback by that. Uh, this number 12 and the conditions um, seems a bit harsh to me. I, I, I'm not 100% sure that uh, I, I really, um, I, I was quite taken aback when I read it that there is so much that you cannot do. Um, uh, where others seem to have got that freedom to do just that. Now, uh, uh, yeah, you were saying that this is not gravelled in stone. Did I get the right uh, uh, right pickup in this? Because it, I don't know. It seems a bit harsh to me. You correct. This is not set in stone. It, it's it's merely an officer recommendation. Uh, I mean, I'm not making excuses here, but sometimes the um, the 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 drafting of these reports do, do happen at some speed um and when you kind of look at these things again and again um you kind of question yourself sometimes so it it's really up to members to to debate that and um, it certainly would not be in the slightest unreasonable to um kind of uh, let go of that condition for for the reasons given already the Existing properties that have been built around them, I believe there's more with planning permission to go ahead. Do Are they subject to the same condition as this, as number 12? No, I'm, I'm, I think the, uh, the speaker is correct. They are not subject to that condi condition. Fine. Um, I sometimes get a tiny bit confused with our, um, although I don't doubt he's professional, as a tree officer. What I saw there uh, was not a um, basically an insignificant uh, 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 silver birch, but quite the opposite. What I saw that was a fully mature birch. Birches aren't huge, uh, especially of that ilk as they move towards a mountain uh, ash type of breed. So they, um, yeah. Um, so I'm pleased that the developer and the agent are so. Uh, I've seen the, the value of that and uh, are retaining that. But as going back, some a comment was made, Chair, about um, uh, uh, the style of the, the property itself and this, this sort of a chicken shed. Well, first and foremost, thank God they're not going to put chickens back in there because this is antiquity. Now, what we saw in Wix, that is a modern chicken plant, not that. So people live in strange houses now. I mean, Turner in, uh, caught a glimpse of a, uh, of a trawler turned upside down with a chimney coming out of, uh, uh, out of the bottom of it uh, and uh, people living in that. So people have been living in unusual built houses for many years. So I do see the value in this. And for all its ugliness, it's got a strange sort of beauty. It's like living in a church, isn't it? It's that kind of gothic revival thing that you want to be involved with. So I can actually see that. I wouldn't want to live there myself, but uh, I do see the point of why people want to see that. But I am concerned by this 12, and I don't know how the other panel are thinking. I, I wouldn't mind just seeing a, sort of an amendment to this, as I think, considering the other people around. It seems a bit harsh on this one. That's only my opinion, don't you know? Thank you. Um, 
Well, just following that, really, I mean, I would love to see the developer come forward, actually, with an adapted chicken house um, and just to see what kind of chimneys they could have out the top of it. And um, it was, I think it would be a refreshing change for the the, uh, the planning committee to, to view. But putting that, that wish to one side and really to to... to to save time I think on this one because I, I really don't think that there is anything that can be done to uh, realistically to, to go against this proposal. I think we are where we are. I've already stated that it is with deep regret that this uh, the whole thing is allowed to happen um, but we're way down the line um, and I think you know in future officers should be very mindful of any chicken hutches rabbit hutches and guinea pig hutches or whatever that may come forward in the future in the middle of the countryside somewhere um, because um, I think we should be looking and strengthening those policies or the government just change policy and just say they're allowed to do it and just save all the, the rubbish that's going to happen so but with the, putting that all to side um, I recommend that we remove that, that item number 12 and I would recommend approval. I'll second that, Chair. Yeah. Councillor Morris pit me to the post, but I would just suggest, as Councillor Harris does, that we delete. No, we don't delete. Yes, we do. We delete condition 12 and then we insert condition 12 with regard to the tree um, so that it is saved. Um, and obviously the agent has said that they're quite happy to accept that. Is, is, it, um, is it relevant to put anything in about exploring options for renewable energy? sources we haven't discussed that so i, I think we, we've got the condition um seeking the details of the electric vehicle charging points um and I, I think um that 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 plus the you know the assessment is is sufficient to to, to discharge at your obligations to, to ensure that there's no conflict with that policy um the the scheme is the scheme in front of you um I, I don't think there's any conflict with that with that renewable energy policy with that condition in place if i can just add to that i i'm assuming i i mean i automatically assume now with any new build that it's going to reach the standards um the modern standards for insulation etc and uh that obviously would be um, helpful to uh, saving, conserving energy as well. I don't think I have a second to the President. Mm -hmm. Morris? Yeah. Have you seconded yes, it this? Is. You have. Right. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for that. that. That's probably my fault. I didn't have the amplifier on at the time. Um, right, uh, just ask the officer's views, because I'm personally not convinced yet, about the removal of Clause 12. Um, does the fact that uh, if we delete that, that means that people could have a swimming pool in the back garden and various other things without planning permission? Yes, that, that will be the, the, the implication of removing that condition. Yeah. But again, in, in retrospect, um, having listened to the debate, I think officers are perhaps a little bit overzealous to include that condition in the first place. Right. Councillor sure. Alexander. Um, the reason why I questioned it and then I went as a second to the proposal with that, the removal of that is because none of the other area around that has that attached to it. And listening intently to um, the young lady speaking here tonight, it is obvious that, um, that I think that would have been challenged. And quite frankly, I can't see that standing water. Um, uh, so that's my opinion, don't you know? 
so um, uh, I, I think that we're done. It's, it's, the, it's, the right, it's the right thing to do. And that's it. My second on that still stands. I'm absolutely fine with that. I think if they do decide to build swimming pools, that would leave us really in the deep end. And I don't don't really, I don't, <laughs> I, it would be a quite small pool anyway if they did. And I, I think it would be challenged and I, I don't see the point. I think just remove it. <laughs> the uh, uh, removal of clause 12 still stands. So the recommendation is um, that the oh yeah with, with the, the, the removal of, of section uh, item 12, but with the tree put put in its place. That was I think that was the proposal, and I'm happy to accept that. Right. Yes, I think I've got that. Yes, um, the recommendation on 64 and the con other conditions on page 74 to 76, the conditions and the informative, with the exception then that clause 12 on GDO is removed, but it gives protection for the tree. It's in place. In place of it. Yes. Yes. So you know now what you're going to vote on. Um, I said last time we do it by um, voting on it, but uh, we didn't. We did a show of hands. That was my fault. So let's do it this time with a show of hands. And um, it starts with Councillor Alexander. Four. Yeah, yeah. Show of hands. <laughs> so, it's been a long day. Yeah, it's been a long day. Well, Councillor Alexander has indicated without a show of hands. So. <laughs> That's better. We've got a show of hands. Show of hands. Those in favour. <laughs> yeah. At last, that is approved then as slightly amended. Chair, is there any way that we can instill a bad joke box? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, that then completes our business this evening. Um, thank you very much. And um, as the secretary likes to report the time, I make it uh, finishes at 9.08. So um, that's approved. You, Nan. So thank you all very much. We will finish this meeting.